Hey there, I'm Ryan. Welcome to today's acrylic landscape lesson. All of the tools and materials will be listed in the video description. And if you'd like help with the drawing process, I will have the traceable up over on Patreon along with the reference photo for color matching. If you're interested, check it out. But with that, let's jump into it and have some fun. We're going to begin here today with a one inch flat headed brush because it's great for mixing and blocking in our larger backgrounds. That said, I am going to dip the bottom third of it into a little bit of water to help extend the wet life of our paint so that we can blend with it for a little bit longer. That said, here we have our initial palette of titanium white, Mars black, and ultramarine blue. I will put them up on screen so you can see all of the different brands, but we are going to start in the sky in the background. So we'll grab quite a lot of our titanium white, move that to a clean spot on our palette. We'll grab about one tenth, maybe one twelfth that in Mars black. And again, one tenth, maybe one twelfth that in ultramarine blue. They are going to affect the pigment very minorly. And if you feel you need any more color, you can add just a little dab of each more. But generally it's better to add less of the more saturated pigments when mixing and build up. That said, I like this for the base. So we'll head in towards the bottom of our sky. I will be painting over a lot of my drawings, but that's okay. We can always go back and redo that either by using the traceable, looking at the reference photo, or just by getting a little creative. I'll work this up and you can see that there is immediately this larger tree. I'm just going to find pockets, openings that I feel like we won't see that foliage show through. And there we go. Now, as we get higher, we're going to make the sky slightly darker, add a bit of a gradient. It'll create some depth very early on. So again, a little bit more of our blue and our Mars black. Not a dramatic amount. And here on the canvas, you can see a little bit of a streak going on. That's essentially just because it wasn't blended well enough on the palette beforehand. So here I'll mix up a little bit more, but we are going to spend some time on this mix and just ensure that different portions don't have different values and hues. With that, heading back, much more consistent. I'm placing it right above our previous application and then I'll start blending it down with a very soft stroke. The more pressure you add, the harder it'll be to do the blends. So we make that very soft, grab some extra water, make it a little bit darker and a little bit more blue as we will continue to progressively do. And we'll just go a bit higher. Here we're blending in that new application into the rest of the sky. So my brush isn't working purely horizontally. There's a little bit of an angle so that we bring the old pigment up and the new pigment down. And then I do go back horizontally just to straighten and flatten all of those markings. Make sure it looks nice and clean. As we approach the top, I'm not going to add any more Mars Black. Instead, just a little bit more of our ultramarine blue into the mix. And we'll finish this off. Though it is worth noting when we're working with acrylics, generally with our backgrounds, we might want to do two maybe three layers, just so that it's nice and thick. It will make it look significantly more professional. And often I think people really love the end result significantly more when that extra time is put in. So I went ahead and did my second layer, then let it fully dry to the touch. The next step is to add some clouds, specifically over here. And to do so, we are going to add some brilliant purple to our palette, though we're not going to be using much of it. I'm going to begin by grabbing a lot of titanium white and mixing that either on top of or right beside our previous mixture. That way I can compare them as we go. We'll grab just a hint of our Mars black our blue, and we'll attempt to recreate essentially the brighter pigment that we were previously working with because we are going to be starting at the bottom of our clouds and the ones that are the most distance and 
their pigment, their value will well reflect what we had going on here though. We'll make it a little bit more gray so you can throw in just a hint more of your Mars black and then we'll also grab a hint of our brilliant purple. Really not that much, maybe again one tenth. We are being very careful and we are slowly adding more. This should also be a good lesson in that we don't go for the first pigment we mix. And I'll do a little test on my reference photo, which we have up here. Looks good, okay. So, we'll grab our pigment. We'll skip a little bit of our space here. And then we'll start painting it in at the bottom, working horizontally. I'm going to leave openings, particularly around some of these edges, just like so. Working with horizontal strokes. And as we get higher, remember things get a little bit more dark, a little bit more saturated. Hint of blue, hint of our purple yet again. Not too much though, we take off the excess elsewhere. And we can also do a hint of Mars black if we feel it gets too saturated. Work my brush over a couple times, and we'll head back in. We'll do a bit of a blend into the previous mixture, but for the most part we will work up here. We are going to allow it to trail off at the top, and the majority of it over on the left hand side is essentially going to be covered in our foliage a little bit later. So we don't have to worry about that too much. Get you a little bit closer though. Now up towards the top, we are going to incorporate a little bit more separation and I'll leave some of our clouds protruding out this way with some sharper markings. This way, it looks like the cloud breaks off into slightly smaller pieces. And we can also have a couple working their way in from the right hand side of the canvas. We'll try to make them different sizes. We'll extend some of them in farther than others. And then we can also use the corner of our brush to tap in some extra smaller clouds, which can also be interjected throughout the openings down below. Though we don't want to overdo it, this is the background and we do want to maintain something relatively simple. It's also worth noting that this will really start to show up near the top as we do begin working on a background which is darker. And that can actually lead to a really nice effect. But it does mean we should be a bit more sparing. Now we'll be switching to our smaller liner brush as we'll want to add some details into those clouds and make them more three-dimensional. So essentially the light is touching the tops of all of our clouds and that's going to wrap down around the sides of them, leaving the under portions significantly darker. So we'll make sure our brush is nice and damp. We'll grab some additional titanium white and work that into our previous mixture. The amount you work in is very much dependent upon how much of that previous mixture you want to work with, but I do want to make something that is noticeably brighter. And the only pigment I'm adding here is the titanium white. So it'll desaturate it, but it will brighten it up. And then I'm going to head towards the top edges of our protruding pieces. And with a series of tap and drag effects, we're just going to brighten that up minorly. We can build on it over time to progressively make it brighter, but the first step should be a subtle one. There we go. And again, this is essentially just light working its way onto the top and then down the side of each cloud. So now we can actually see the sides of our cloud and start to get that impression of something that does exist within a three-dimensional space. So we've only started working on the clouds. 
but we do have some depth through the gradient in the actual sky, and now this as well. That said, like me, you'll probably quickly find that you are done working through the edges. And at that point, we're going to create additional openings within the cloud. So I say, you know what? Maybe this area of the cloud's a little bit thin. So let's work in a little bit of this highlight. And then if you want, you can blend it down slightly. And we'll splash these throughout sometimes extending different portions. Less is more is definitely the attitude I would recommend initially. But again, much like the actual values themselves, over time, you can add and make it more prominent. Here we have a rather large portion of the cloud I'm working in trying to space out my markings, but again, all very subtle. Grab slightly more. Head towards the top, reinstigate some highlights. This mixture has a little bit less water, so it's less transparent and therefore brighter. I wanted to do this for the top particularly. as it's closer to us and we should see slightly more contrast. As a general rule, as you move closer to a subject or as it moves closer to you, you'll see more saturation and more contrast because in the distance there's a lot of that reflective atmospheric light. All the colors are kind of reflecting onto each other and the eye can't make distinctions between the subjects too such a great degree. So here, again, as we get higher in the sky, but therefore closer to us with the clouds, they can be a bit more prominent. And I'm just softening the bottom of this highlight by going over it repeatedly, slightly circular strokes, and it's going to give it a more soft bottom edge. So here we are, a little bit closer, just so you can see the detail work. I will go over areas a couple of times. I will create these very soft openings within the clouds, just like so. And I think, you know what, we'll make it a little bit brighter. More titanium white, just like that. And every time we apply this highlight, a second time or a third time to the same area, we'll build up that highlight because we are working with acrylics, which are being thinned by water, and therefore we do see the under layer to a point through our new applications. And the more layers we add, the more we brighten that under layer and turn our application into something much closer to what we have actually on the palette. So do you recognize if you're kind of new to this that the applications you make over previous paint are going to look slightly different than what they look like on the palette simply because your pigments will probably be semi-transparent. But through layers you can get the exact color you want. Like that. Really like that. Take a couple of steps back and see what it looks like. Sometimes when we're up close, it can be difficult to really assess that. So from a distance, I think it's looking quite good, but often when we're really close, we get very tight into the details. And here we can look at more balancing. So we look at how open that is in comparison to that. If we like the transition down here, the general movements, if they're too similar or if they need something to kind of bind them together. I, I like, again, these movements, but I feel like this area is really open. So I'm just going to, or really close rather with clouds. So I'm just going to incorporate another opening. And now we almost have one, two, three of our larger openings, almost acting as a leading line, bringing us into the painting. 
and we'll just go over that a couple times. Additionally, if we feel like an area might be a little bit too cloud heavy, we can just do a couple little taps. And if you feel like your strokes are getting a little too definitive, you can always hold your brush from farther back. It'll make painting more difficult, but it'll make your strokes more natural and more loose. So if you find you're accidentally making the same application over and over, this is a great way of just diversifying a little bit. That said, I very much like our clouds. I think it's time for our next step. Now we're going to start working on our distant mountains, which we can see in the reference photo, though they are quite far away and quite small. Because of that, I will be sticking with the smaller liner brush, but I will be grabbing some burnt umber for the first time, though we're going to desaturate it to a great degree. With that, I'll start by grabbing some of my titanium white, and we'll move that fairly close to our previous mixtures, just so we can ensure that the value isn't too far off. We'll grab about half that in our burnt umber, taking off the excess there, and rendering a fairly bright brown. We'll grab a hint of our Mars black, maybe one sixth, work that in. And we want it to complement the colors in the background because it is so far away. So I'll also grab maybe one tenth that in our ultramarine blue and one tenth that in our brilliant purple. Mix those all up. Do a little test on my reference photo. And you know what? I think it could be a little bit brighter. So we'll just throw in some extra titanium white, head into our canvas, and draw the top of it. Now I do want this to be slightly darker than what it is going to be in the end, because I want a darker base layer to work on top of. Now obviously, this brush, while great for detail work, will struggle to render a fairly large application. So I'm using a bit of water, which is thinning my paint. It means I'll have to go in and do a second layer, but that's okay. Then we'll double up our titanium white, head in to the left-hand side, because I feel like we'll have some extra light coming from the middle section here behind the trees. Brighten that. And we'll just do some lines that work their way down. We'll keep them fairly rough. We'll have it work its way onto the other side slightly, just like so. It's very small, very subtle. Not a lot of work has to go into this as the majority of it will be covered. We just need it to be subtle and in this distance. So we'll let that dry, do another layer, and then we'll head on to the next step. As an update, upon further looking at the reference photo, I realized the majority of the light is actually going to be moving this way, which means the sun is on this side of the canvas, so this side of the mountain should actually be brighter. So in my second layer and application here, doubling up on my titanium white, which I'm applying to this side, leaving the other one a little bit darker, creating some nice contrast, and here we have a little bit of extra light, as if the mountain moves up, comes back down, but then there's also this little piece that comes up and then connects towards the back. We can also make that back a little bit darker with more of not only our burnt umber and Mars black, but again, we also work in some purple and blue, just so that it's nice and cohesive with everything else that we have going on in the rest of the painting. We don't want too much, but it's a great way of just making it a little bit more captivating. There we go. Nice healthy mix with the brighter pigment. Find something in between. A little bit of a balanced mixture. Again, slowly introducing that titanium white. And I think that right there will be really nice. Not too bright, not too dark. Good mix. Small brush, so lots of detail, but it's subtle detail, which is exactly what we want for 
the background of our piece. So now we're going to start working on the backing trees here in the distance and because they are far away we're going to go for a mid value and we don't want it to get too bright or too saturated but we will be applying it with our one inch flat headed brush because we have quite an area of space to cover here and for the very first time we'll be using some sap green on our palette. I will put up the actual tube of paint on the screen so you know exactly which brand I'm using. That said we will grab said sap green and move that to a clean spot. We'll grab maybe about half that in our Mars Black and half that in our Titanium White. We'll mix them up quite thoroughly. The combination should desaturate it to a relatively good extent. And I think we need to desaturate it a little bit further. So we'll add about a third of this mixture in Mars Black, about a third of the mixture in our Titanium White and that is much better. It is room to get brighter, it is room to get darker, so it is a great initial mid value. With that, I'm going to start along the edges of the land because when you have fresh paint, it is easiest to craft those very intentional sharp lines. So we'll start there, and then we'll start moving inwards and upwards. So. Going back and forth, there's lots of linear motions going on here. While we slowly lift up, our technique will change as we get towards the top, but I do need a little bit more water. Head back to our palette. Going in with a bit of a tapping instead of a drag, though we do lead into a drag with our taps after. And then, I'll just rotate my brush, just letting the corner protrude to get the tops of some trees. And we'll let it be a little bit rough so that it looks like we have extended little pieces of foliage which stick out and create something a bit more unique. We can further expand upon this with a different brush, but you can get a good, a good start here with the flat headed brush and we're essentially just taking advantage of that opportunity. But as you can see, we do have a nice top there. The trees are going to get smaller as you work our way towards the back. And we're actually going to cover pretty much all of these trees with yellows, oranges, and reds. So don't have to worry about it too much, but it'll be nice to get a decent base in there. There we go. And of course, as per usual, we should let it dry, come back, do a second layer, and then we can proceed into our next step. Now, once that's applied and dried, we are going to go back in and start applying some shadows, which will act as texture and detail, but we will build on top of them with highlights. So it's going to look a little messy, but intentionally so for a little bit. With that, we need it to be a little bit darker as these are the darker points within the tree. So we'll just grab a little bit of extra Mars black. Again, we'll stick with that general third. Work that in, see if we need a little bit more. And I think, I think it could be a little bit darker. So we'll add that. Though for the actual application, I'm not going to be using this brush. Instead, we'll be switching to a half inch flat headed brush with stiff bristles. You can use a smaller or larger brush, but you do want the bristles to be fairly stiff and we will peel them back so that we get a fairly disheveled look. And I do get asked sometimes, how do you tell if it's a stiff bristled brush or a soft one? Often, if it's a little bit stiff, when you pull these back and apply a little bit of pressure, they will stay for you. So. That is essentially what we are looking for there. Going to apply a little bit of paint to the tips. We don't want much because we don't want it to get start condensing the bristles. And then I'm going to go towards the bottom of the tree line and start with a bit of a tapping effect. Rotating my brush in the air. And that is going to give us a different marking and impression every time. It's very subtle though, at least with this first application. 
And I think I want to build it up just a little bit. So back to the one inch, a little bit more Mars black in the mix. Grab this. And that looks great. Let's get you a little bit closer though so you can see the detail work. So here we are, a bit more up close. Again, starting at the bottom of our tree line because that is essentially where the least amount of light is going to be. As we get higher up in the trees, more of the foliage will be able to catch that sunlight. So we'll let it dissipate as we work our way up, generally grabbing from the bottom mid area and then rotating through our tapping effect. We're really not looking for a drag at any point as that would render a, a different type of application that we're not really looking for. Though I am going to grab a little bit more directly from the palette just to even out the transition area. But you don't want it to be a perfectly clean transition and you don't want it to look entirely uniform. It's great if certain areas look a bit more patchy because it means that some areas are a bit more open and it can actually make different distinctions between trees later on. So don't worry about that. As for this bottom area, that is going to be our grass. And unlike the top, we are going to do a little bit of a drag. So I'm going to press the brush very lightly onto the canvas, do a little bit of a drag down. I'm going to randomly work my way throughout here. You can rotate your brush in between your strokes but don't rotate it when the brush is actually on the canvas. Again, this is going to look messy for the near future, but it's going to add a lot of really nice detail and texture for the later layers. One of those things where when you want to build a, build a house, you have to start with the awkward looking foundation. And then we'll go for a mix of a tap and a drag in between the two. That way we get a very natural transition and some good depth. But nice and easy, time for the next step. Now once that's dry, we'll start working on the top area of all of these trees, predominantly the areas that are being hit with light and are therefore brighter. These highlights will clean it up and really bring out a lot of this. And it's also worth noting that in the reference photo, you have a lot more of an orange and yellow set of foliage through here. We're going to paint more green than is actually visible in the reference photo, simply so that we have more option later on as to where we want to interject those other colors. But with that, we are going to continue doing our mixing with the one inch flat headed brush. We'll grab some of our sap green. We'll grab an equal amount of our titanium white. Work those two together. And then we'll grab maybe one fifth that in our Mars black, just to calm it down a little bit. Additionally, you can add in some cadmium yellow if you want to make it a bit warmer. We might do that later on, but for now I'm happy. And for the actual application process, I'm going to switch over to a fan brush. Now this fan brush is also a fairly stiff bristled. So all of the bristles stand out individual and we, when we go in with the tap, we get a lot of different impressions rather than a uh, conglomerated amount of bristles. So great brush for rendering detail and foliage, especially in the distance. And much like the half inch flat headed brush, we're just going to add a little bit to the tips and the ends. Really don't want that much. I'm going to head to the top of my tree and I'm just going to be using essentially the corner of this brush, which as you can see is still creating quite a number of markings and implications here. And I'm just going to start working that down. Pick another area for a second tree just like that. And while it's brighter than what we have, there's certainly a lot of room to have it continue to get brighter, which is great. It means that if we want, we can go back and add a warmer layer on top of it. I'm purposefully missing areas within here so that we get different clusters and I'll go back over other areas that really protrude that I want to catch additional light. There we go. And this can kind of 
come out a little bit farther, almost to the point where it's in the grass. Really nice. And then we can do a bit of a softer application throughout the majority of the rest. Though, again, this will be covered with other colors fairly soon. Maybe we'll also do a bit of a larger protruding bush down here as well. There we go. All looking a little bit nebulous right now, but the forms will make sense when we have more trees worked in. Then we can make this back area a bit more green too. Then with what little pigment we have left, we can work over a negative space. And we'll grab a little bit, maybe some of our previous darker pigment. We'll create a mix in between the two. So it's darker than our highlight, but it's lighter than our past application. And we can just do a little bit of a tap down here. Tap and drag for our grass, very similar to how we applied it the first time. We're going to do a lot more with the grass later on, but we're just trying to ensure that things remain fairly cohesive within the, the process. And you know what, I, I looked at the viewfinder, which is essentially me taking a couple steps back, I get a better perspective. And I think I just want a bit more green in this area, a bit more brighter green, just so I have more option. Yeah, glad we did that. Okay, time for our next color and step. Now we're going to grab a couple new colors, including a cadmium yellow, a burnt sienna, Naples yellow, and a cadmium red medium hue. These are going to be used to create all of our different fall colors in the background here, and I will be using a smaller liner brush to apply it, as I do want to be able to work much more finely with my applications and create something that's very intentional, where the other brushes randomize things a little bit, which can be great, but it's not what we want right here right now. And with that in mind, we're going to start with a fairly basic orange. I'll grab some of my cadmium red medium hue, about an equal mixture of my cadmium yellow deep hue, work those together, and that should render a nice orange, but it'll be a bit too saturated for what we want here. So I'll grab some Naples yellow, maybe about one half, definitely desaturated it in a nice way, but we need to desaturate it a little bit more, so hint of titanium white and a hint of Mars black. Very small amount of the Mars black though. We do need to be very careful with it and the yellow in the same mixture. Though I do like that a lot. And I'm going to head towards some of these back trees first, simply because it's a bit farther away and it won't be as noticeable if our applications or colors aren't perfect from the beginning, it'll act as a bit of a testing zone. So I'm going to go in and just tap where I want this initial tree to be. Because we're working with acrylics, our application is going to be semi-transparent. So we're not going to get that full orange that we have on the palette, but we can build up to it and it'll give us room to really expand over time. Now that's quite bright. It's okay, we are going to brighten a lot of the greens, but I know I like it. So, let's head a little bit farther down, skip a bit of a spot, maybe we'll add some yellow in between there. Go in for the tap, and I'm going all the way over the green so that no green is showing at that point. And we let it dissipate as you move towards the bottom where we do get the green and inevitably some of that grass, right? We can throw a little bit of it over here. But we don't want to essentially just use the same color through all of this. It'll look very unnatural quickly. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this, move away from this area, and we'll interject smaller tree and some foliage for it right over here. trying to create openings for this one because it's smaller. 
though the middle portion is going to be a bit more condensed. There we go. And we can throw a tiny bit of it up into this area. And I'm just trying to ensure that we have this color in multiple areas of the painting so that it looks significantly more natural later on. So I like that. Good start. Very bright. Let's start to balance it a little bit with some yellows. We'll grab a good amount of our cadmium yellow deep hue, equal amount of our Naples yellow, and then we'll grab a hint of our titanium white. My brush wasn't perfectly clean, so I am getting a little bit of orange mixed in here, but that is okay. And now, let's head over here. Let's start working on a yellow tree. Now I don't have a lot of water on my brush, and you really don't want it for very specifically your yellow applications because yellow is arguably one of the most thin acrylic pigments. And the more water you add, the more you'll thin it out. The more thin it is, the more you'll see your green through it. And you just won't get that bright, vibrant, nice fall yellow that's potentially achievable with a bit more of a dry brush. So we'll just go ahead and do that. First layers will look a little messy. It's okay. Going to go over some of our previous applications a couple of times because every time you do, you build up that pigment and it looks more natural. See less of the green showing through. But you can leave some portions to be darker and have that green showing through to create depth within this type of tree, and that can be nice. So you do have some option. Okay. It's looking, and I'll be honest, a little cartoony right now, but we are still just getting started. We need a lot more diversity. We need a lot more buildup of highlights, but we'll get there. We'll most certainly get there. So we'll work this in. Have it go towards the bottom, dissipate. Get lost behind some of the greener highlights. And of course, we do need some yellow over here as well. Let's have it covering up some of this orange. But also getting lost behind the back of this green tree. And my applications are looking fairly thin because I don't have a lot of pigment on my brush, but we will go back and grab more shortly. Thickening the areas we want, leaving some areas open. And I know this is a bit of a, a longer clip, but it's just a, a fairly large area to work on, and we are jumping around quite a lot. Again, still have that cartoony issue, but we will solve that. Let's start highlighting some of our greens. We'll grab our sap green, grab an equal mixture of our Naples yellow. You can see that creates just a really nice green on its own. Let's take this. Start tapping on some light highlights to the top here. Not too many, but we'll have it dissipate towards the edge. The light is coming in like that. So we are keeping our lighting scheme in mind. Let's grab a bit more. Head over here. Create some protruding trees that are going to be a bit more interesting. Again, in the goal of making this less cartoony, we do need to diversify more. There we go. You can even take a little bit if it's watered down and just create a slight grass line towards the bottom. Very subtle there though. Let's brighten it up more, titanium white, which will desaturate it, but we can grab more sap green to resaturate it. 
And that should be, again, a little bit brighter than what we were working with. We were successful. Though we are working in increments right now, very small ones. So now we have about four layers on our greenery, or at least a couple portions of it. One layer on our yellows, and one layer on our oranges. So that does go to show that we definitely need to spend some additional time on those. But we needed to let it dry first before we could really make an impact. So that's kind of what we're doing. We're painting the green while we wet the rest dry. With that, I'm going to clean my brush quite well. This is all going to be red. I'm, uh, <laughs> I've been looking at it, I've been considering it for a while. I can see it in the reference photo. I was like, do I really want to do that? I, I do. So with that, before we get there, let's make an even brighter yellow than what we've been previously working with. Go in, tap on some really pretty highlights. We can work those through here a little bit. And the final detail is going to be done with either the fan brush or the half inch. Realistically, they're going to get a smaller marking than what we can do with the liner brush here as we're working with individual bristles with that brush. But this one did give us the control to craft the trees in the ways that we want to. So that's why we start with this one. Continuously going back and grabbing more paint because once it starts running out with the yellow, you just really don't get much on the palette uh, transferred to the, to the canvas. A little bit more titanium white. Okay. Starting to have some better depth. Definitely a ways to go, but better. Let's go back to our red, cadmium red, a little bit of our cadmium yellow deep hue, and I'm going with the deep hue because it'll retain a lot of the saturation where the Naples yellow won't, and then I'll just make it a little bit more earthy with the burnt sienna. Maybe hint of titanium white. We don't want to turn it into a pink, but we do want to brighten it. Much better. Much, much better. Good. There we go. Now, I do think this is going to look a lot more fall once we do make that area significantly more red. So let's start with a mid-value base. Again, we have the darker value in there. We don't need to continue with that. We'll start with an even mixture of our cadmium red deep hue and our burnt sienna. Grab a little bit of our titanium white. And then we'll add a hint of our Mars black. And normally when I say hint of Mars black, I grab some and then I wipe off the excess and it really isn't meant to be a, a grand amount. With that, we will start making this look a whole lot more like fall. So, we're getting closer to the foreground, which means foliage is a little bit more noticeable, clusters are a little bit more noticeable, we can have openings, show the green through. If we'd like, I notice that it isn't something that's necessarily prominent in the reference photo, so you don't have to. You can take that artistic liberty should you want to. And we'll just build this up, have it lessen significantly as we get towards the bottom. We want multiple layers. And if you want to ensure that it is nice and thick, we can wait and let it dry, but we can also just apply significantly more paint while it's wet. 
and generally there shouldn't be any issues. I'm overlapping a lot of the green at the top, maybe letting a little bit show through there. I do want it to eventually overlap portions of our yellow. There we go. Okay. Now, I do think I'm going to let that dry, come back, add a couple, add a little bit more to the thin areas, let that dry, and then we'll continue to add some detail together. And hopefully, we can start adding in some of the actual tree trunks, some of the proper highlights with the sharper brushes, and work on the grass too. There's a lot to do, but it'll look really good if we take our time and we go through the steps in uh, the best way possible. So now that all of our larger trees are applied, we're going to go in and throw in a lot of little small ones just to, again, balance things a little bit better and then we can get to the real details. So I know I want one that works through here as a bit of a transition between these two. We'll start with a bit of a green, a Naples yellow, and I think we'll also make it a bit more earthy with some burnt sienna. So we're starting to combine colors in ways that we haven't really before to create combinations that are going to be a bit more interesting in the piece than what we already accomplished. So this can work its way over the yellow, over the reddish orange, and it'll just find its way down towards the grass. But we'll see hints of the other two showing through it, and that'll create some easy depth. It'll be the highlights later that make it pop, if we want it to pop. Everything doesn't have to pop, by the way. We can have some areas that are intentionally more subtle. The vibrancy of every tree is not actually going to be the same in real life, and our painting can reflect that. I wouldn't be wrong for doing so. Here I'm just expanding the highlights on some of these green trees to be a bit higher, like that. And now, I think through this area, we need something. So let's add a bit more yellow. We'll go with our Naples yellow, as it is our staple. Some of our cadmium yellow deep hue, titanium white. And I'm looking at the reference photo for a lot of these ideas, though I am changing them. And you are more than welcome to take artistic liberties and add trees wherever you see fit. Because there are so many trees and so many varying colored trees, we are going to have pieces that do look different at this point. There's nothing wrong with that. These lessons are meant to help guide you and teach you not only how to paint a very specific thing, but how to paint it and the general idea of it so that you can paint similar subjects in the future. And hopefully through these techniques you can Make those changes, make it your own, have fun, do all of that good stuff. So, just working a lot of this yellow around this previously simple area. I think it's looking pretty neat. There we are. Generally, the more we diversify, the more natural it's going to look. Though I do want more of a yellow green, so we'll take those two pigments, the green that we had there and the yellow there, work them together, you can work a nice mid value for the top of this. I really like that. That worked well. Now, we'll add a little bit of a highlight to our red here. Grab some of that red, a little bit of Naples yellow. Light's coming this way. And then we'll just start tapping this on with a bit of a rotated marking. Have it dissipate as you move towards the left hand side.
Don't have too much water on my brush right now, just so I can get some more thick applications. And this color is really nice because it gives us room to grow, but it does start building a little bit of depth. And of course, we can splash it in elsewhere to make the rest of our painting look even better. Now, yet again, once everything is dry, we are going to start adding some additional detail. We'll go in with the mixing of the one inch. We're going to start with the yellows because it is the most delicate color and we don't want to work with diluted brushes afterwards. So for the true highlights of the yellow, we're going to grab an equal mixture of our deep hue and our Naples yellow, but then we are going to take off that remaining paint, grab a lot of our titanium white, and work that in. This is going to desaturate it to a great degree, and by far make the brightest pigment that we have yet. So I'm just spreading that about so that I have ample area to grab from. Put that down, and we'll switch to our nice little half inch flat headed stiff brush. Grab that on the, the tips and the ends. And we'll just do a nice little tap and already that looks so much better. Okay, great. I, I can't wait till we apply it to all of our different foliage, but it's a really nice start. Just goes to show that while the liner brush is small, there really is no way of achieving detail this sharp, this minute, as going in with a tapping method of either the fan brush or the half inch stiff flat headed. There we go. Spanning it out just a little bit more, a couple of spots. Now we'll put that brush down, grab our one inch liner. We'll now move over to the green because green and actually, mm, let's go orange. We're going to go orange because it'll be easier to transition to orange and then to green than it would be from green to orange. So we'll grab some of our cadmium red deep hue. We'll grab more of our cadmium yellow because we want the saturated yellow to mix with the saturated red. Again, more titanium white in these mixtures than ever before. Put that down. I think we could probably make this a little bit more orange, but I do like it as a, a starting point. So, red, saturated yellow. Go a little bit more red, a little bit more saturated yellow. Every time we do this, we will be re-interjecting more saturation into the mix because we are moving farther and farther away from a titanium heavy mix. Much better. Much, much better. Things are starting to amalgamate in a very natural way, which is what we wanted. It's looking much more natural and cohesive. Now, I think we'll do a smaller orange tree right down here. You can see one in the reference photo and I really like it. Remember, you can switch to the fan brush if you want a little bit more control using the corner of your fan brush. But for now, I think I'm still happy. Grab a little bit of titanium white. It's risky blending with this brush, but if it's stiff enough and you don't have too much paint, you can work with it. Perfect. Okay, we got away with it. <laughs> Very good. So, now, we will switch over to our red, I think, because we have the red and then we'll treat the, the green differently. 
grab our red, grab some titanium white to brighten it. This will make it more of a pink after a certain point. So we're going to add it in slowly. You know what? That actually works out really well. Let me test it on the reference photo. That's nice. I think we can go a little bit brighter even. There we go. Still looking like a red. Reddish orange, at least. Add that to our brush. Go in with our taps. Rotating the brush in the air in between the taps. Further solidifying, this is a general aesthetic throughout the piece. Remember, it needs to look messy before it looks proper. Just part of the process. And I mention that, by the way, as frequently as I do, just because I know it's really easy to get not, not super uh, encouraged, or maybe discouraged even, when things aren't going your way. And with acrylics, they're a bit deceiving in that often even when they are going your way, it looks like they aren't until we get to the, uh, the later steps. So just so you know, it's going well. We'll grab some of our sap green, titanium white. I want this to be warmer, so I'll add some Naples yellow. Oh, that's really nice. A little bit of titanium white. A little bit more Naples yellow. Let's give that a go. Now, this brush is still very, very full of paint, so we'll just Take that off as best we can without using water on a cloth. Come back in, grab the green. There we go. Again, it's all getting to become a little bit more homogenized. And that is what we want. We can create darker variants of each color. And I'll show you an example with green just because we're currently working with it. But we can re-interject shadow and darker pigment should you want to with this technique. Just like that. And that can work. It can actually work really well. But I do recommend taking a couple of steps back after this, figuring out what areas you do want to edit rather than just continuing to work on it very close up because there's a lot going on and often that wider perspective is going to give you what you need to know before really proceeding properly. Now I'm just going to do so now. One area that I feel like needs more depth for sure is right here. So that's this pink. We'll mix some Mars black in with it. Has a little bit of green but that's okay. There we go. Has some extra depth now. Very good. What you want to avoid is accidentally making your colors look dirty and that's when you just apply too many over top of each other and continue to blend until everything gets more of a brownish gray interjected but that can be avoided by, again, just taking those steps back and taking it slow. I do want a bit of a darker red, so we'll grab that, that. I am mixing with the brush that you weren't supposed to mix with. I'd like to note that. <laughs> Switching to the one inch is probably ideal, but I've been doing this for quite some time and I just feel like I I'm comfortable enough with the brush, and you might be too. And if you are, feel free to ignore me and use this brush as well. But this is more of a, should probably do what I recommend rather than do what I'm doing situation. There we go. Again, just looks better and better. Now we're going to get a lot closer 
I have an even smaller liner brush than before, and these markings won't be as small as what we have on there, but they will be able to be incredibly targeted, which is the most important part right now. So, I'm going to mix up the brightest variant of everything that I've done, so the brightest yellow, the brightest green, all of it, and we'll just clean up the edges of our trees. So I'm looking for the areas that will be receiving the most light, the areas that I really want to pop, the areas that might look a little bit messy and that I need to give a visual standing, an area to kind of capture attention, kind of a, the heart of each subject there. So we added some extra yellow into that. We'll go back to our yellow. I like this area a lot, but I feel like it's really non-distinct. So I'm just going to try to create a couple noticeable clusters, bring in this middle section, it's now brighter. And then it does get quite messy down here, so we'll just create some pathways of foliage that lead down and just give it some better form, like so. Though, now that we've done the yellow, or at least portions of it, other portions are starting to look imbalanced. So we will have to go back to those soon, though as we move farther and farther, we need to be more and more careful because the trees are technically visually smaller, right? They're getting farther away, we can't see as much of the detail as we once could. So when I want my impressions to get smaller, I just apply less and less pressure with my brush. The more pressure you apply, the more your bristles expand, the harder it is to get a clean looking application. There we go. Nice and easy. Let's work on the green right there. Or you know what? Let's work on that orange. Yeah. So, brightest orange yet. Going to grab a lot of our saturated yellow and our cadmium red. And I'm using the saturated yellow because we're going to desaturate this a lot with titanium white. And if we use the Naples yellow, an already fairly desaturated yellow, we'd end up with something that really doesn't have any of the vibrance that we want. So, now that we have this, we can come in and there's definitely room to grow with it too. That's nice, we can make it even brighter in a follow-up layer. And I'm not sure how much of this I really want to show, <laughs> simply because it is one of those steps that I could spend actual hours on. But we'll do at least a bit more of it together. I really like these to be real time and show you as much as I possibly can within a lesson. I, I don't want to speed up any of the footage and I also don't want to leave anything out. So. It's one of those interesting scenarios, but I think I'll give you quite a bit of each tree and then maybe just finish it off by myself. Here I'm going to do another second tree like that, but smaller, right off to the side. It'll probably be covered up by other foliage later on, but that's okay. And then we have more orange right up here. So many little layers on this painting. Here we go. Also, fun fact, this is the second time I've painted this area on this painting. I was at this stage before and I was like, you know what? I can teach this in a little bit of a better way. So I covered it all up and then it was green again and then we started with the colors again. That is why this lesson took uh, a little bit longer. Well, that's okay, I think redoing it to do it right is the right call. There we are. Do a little bit more of our heightened red. Just like so. Not sure if you can hear the rain in the background, but it's quite calming, quite nice for this. 
Though we are painting a bit of a, well, or what will be a sunny afternoon. That might be too bright. I did show you how to darken it. I might darken it, I don't know yet. But we darken the mixture for this next application over here. So after taking a couple of steps back, I think that it's not additional sharp detail that we need. It's just a little bit more of spreading out our color. So I won't take too long with this just because you've seen me do it to a great extent, but we'll mix up our mid to dark red that we essentially used for the base of this one right here. So a little bit of white, black, a lot of our cadmium red and our burnt sienna. And I'm just going to work that over top a lot of the green that we have right through here. And I think I'm going to create a tree that's a bit more vertical. I can see one in the reference photo and I really like it. I think it adds a unique flair to the painting. So I'm just going to actually draw a little line there so I know what I'm building up to. And then I'll go back in with my taps. Of course, we will need to do the majority of our final applications here with either the stiff bristled fan brush or the stiff bristled one inch flat headed, but we're just kind of figuring out where exactly we want it to be. Though already looking in the, the viewfinder, so much happier with that. That said, we need to let it dry, so I think I'm going to hydrate, probably grab a banana, and this is your friendly reminder that, well, it's very easy to get lost in the painting process, go hours without eating or drinking, so just do keep that in mind, stay healthy in the process, um, and I'll, I'll be right back. So that was a good little snack break. We are back and that is fully dry. I am going to take the smaller liner brush and just mix up a bit of a brighter variant of our red. We'll use a hint of that Naples yellow, some titanium white, a little bit of our cadmium yellow deep hue. And I would like to note, this red doesn't have to be exactly the same as the other highlighted reds. It is a different tree and it can have a different aesthetic, different hue to it. So here we'll just do a myriad of small taps with the liner brush. We might be able to get away without using the fan brush or the other if we can apply a minimal amount of pressure. It really depends on how well it blends in with the rest of the trees. We'll see. Thinking again, light's coming this way. Bottom will probably be a little bit darker. Right hand side will be a little bit brighter. Like that. Looks fairly good. Let's continue brightening. So we'll just move that over here. And I am trying to change my mixture up just a little bit. Keep it varied. Keep it interesting. Being very careful with my applications. Sometimes it can be difficult to render small markings on wet paint because the wet paint essentially just absorbs it and then you have to press harder with your brush and then you then you end up with a larger marking. So we are being careful. Again, might not have to go in with the other, but we'll see. We'll keep that door open. There we go. I actually like that a lot. <laughs> no, no change is needed. Okay, I'm going to go back to some of the darker pigment and just do another red tree very similar to it on the right hand side. That way we tie in both sides of the canvas. I think it's a fairly distinct pigment. It's darker 
than pretty much everything else. So by contrast alone, it creates something that's relatively unique. Grab my mixed mid value in there. There we go. It's creating a very slight vignette that the edge is darker than this spot. Keeps the eye contained rather than wandering off the side. Lots of little taps. There we are. I like that a lot. It'll also make for a great reflection because it's a bit of a taller tree. So, with that, I think we're going to take a bit of a step back and we have two options. We can start working on the grass or we can start working on the actual exposed areas of the tree trunks and whatnot. So take a step back and we'll go from there. Now, upon thinking about it, we are going to do the actual grass first before we work on the bottom portions of the trees because we want to layer those bottom portions of the trees on top of the grass and it'll just be a lot easier to layer it in that sequence. So with that, back to the one inch for some blending. We're going to be creating a bit of a brighter green, but one that has a bit of a warmer hue to it. So we'll start by grabbing our sap green, move that to a clean spot here on our palette. We'll grab about one third of that in our burnt sienna, and this should warm it up a little bit. And then we'll also go to our Naples yellow to brighten it, but also desaturate it. Though that will brighten it probably a little bit too much. We'll go in for some Mars black, that'll gray it out. And now I think I'll add, again, a little bit more burnt sienna. Get a nice earthy green here, like that. We'll just move it around the palette so you can see it a bit better. And I like it to the point where I'm going to mix significantly more of it. So, I'll keep that to the side, that way I don't accidentally change it into something that I don't like, and now I can just use it as a reference as I continue to craft the next variant of it. That's something I like to do. I also like often to leave a little bit of every mix on the palette somewhere. Not always achievable, especially as you get to the later portions of the painting, but it can really help when you're trying to remix and refine pigments. So, with that, we do our general mix. We we'll switch over to the fan brush very specifically because we do want the elongated ability to uh, do a lot of applications. We'll get that on there, both edges and the front. And we're going to go in with a tap and a slight drag. Now the drag is going to represent the blades of grass that are protruding. They are very far away still. So we don't want to do much of one. It's really just a hint of it. And as you can tell, even the grass is very, very subtle at this point. So now we're going to build up as we do. Go back to this brush, grab more of that Naples yellow. There we go. It's a good step up from what we had. It is also warmer, which is nice. So we'll grab that with our brush. Perfect. Good addition. We're not trying to cover the entirety of the area. We have lots of little openings showing the darker pigments, which of course creates that contrast and gives us the texture we want. We'll let it dissipate as we move up towards the back as we will have shadows under all of the trees. And I'll just build that up a little bit more. And we'll also apply it to the right hand side in a very moderate way. Now, yet again, we continue. <laughs> just to make it brighter and brighter. More of our Naples yellow. If you feel like it's getting a little too warm or a little bit too yellow, you can switch in the titanium white instead. But I'm actually really happy with the general progress we're making here. So 
yet again. By the way, you're probably wondering why the camera is so far away right now. We're really, throughout this process, looking at the grass in relation to the brightness of everything else. And if we are really close to the canvas, that is very difficult to do. So I want you to see essentially value wise where we end up and what the grass looks like from a distance because again, we won't be looking at the grass all that close up most of the time. There we go. Going over the soon to be water a little bit, but that's all right. The light is coming this way. The trees that are hypothetically right here are going to create shadows. And that's why the bottom of this is darker to a point, but there are going to be divots in trees like what we have here, like what we have here, where more light can pass through. We're going to paint that in with this. It's going to make the grass look a lot more interesting, a lot more dimensional, it's going to give the atmosphere a lot more life. So we're going to make this a bit warmer, a bit more yellow, a bit more earthy. We'll go with an equal mix of the cadmium yellow deep hue and the burnt sienna. And we're going to want to brighten it further. So start with a little bit of titanium white. Do a little test on my reference photo. It's looking a little bit too green actually. So we'll go with some extra red. There we go. Now this brush is starting to dry. Just going to take as much of that off as I can. And here we're going to be looking for those lanes. So there's an opening in the trees, creates this light. It's going to dissipate as we get back towards the tree line. It's going to be most prominent on the edge of the water. And then there's a bit of a break and then there's another one over here. Much like all of our other applications, there are multiple layers, that is number one. Number two will require more titanium white. I think I'm going to move it down a little bit so I don't continuously mix with all of that extra green. There we go. Now because what we are currently working on is still wet, we'll probably get a bit of a blend, but as long as we can still get those nice sharp markings, that's okay. It'll just dilute our application a little bit so it's not as bright, but we can always keep building up. There we go. So now we have some light moving that way. And I think we might even be able to make it a little bit brighter. So we'll keep playing. And we'll make it a bit more red this time. Oh, that is a really nice color. I like that a lot. Things are getting a lot less intuitive, I suppose. Initially, we were working with more generic reds and oranges, greens, yellows, and then they started to amalgamate, and now we're really at a point of something interesting. Oh, that's so much better. Good. I think we probably need to wait for it to dry to apply the next application. Mine's just getting a little bit too wet, a little bit too full of paint, but it's definitely going our way. So I went ahead and just added a little bit of extra highlight to it once it dried. Now we are on to the tree trunks. I'll be using the smaller liner brush for this. And I'm actually going to grab something similar to what I have as our highlights right there. Really any amount of that previous mixture will work. 
and it's because it'll have a nice golden glow to the trees, right? So let's say that we have one right here. Applying very little pressure, I have my pinky finger braced on the canvas to eliminate shake from my hand with such a process. And when I apply it, I'm not creating a singular line down. I go a little bit, I take my brush off, I go a little bit, take my brush off. And I'm very consistent with that because it's going to give it a much more natural look in the end. Where if we just did one solid line, often it ends up looking too smooth and artificial. Now here we have some smaller branches which come out and into the tree in different ways. We can have another one that connects to this, gets lost behind the orange right there. I'm trying to grab different variations in my mix. That way all of these are going to look a little bit different. And we are bringing it down into the grass. Again, multiple little spin-offs. You can have some pieces showing through openings in the tree. You don't want to go too, too extravagant with it, but it's a nice little detail that can be very welcome. And soften it a little bit with some finger painting. Here a lot of this one is covered. Don't have to have foliage at the end of every branch. really adds so much to the painting so quickly. Here this one won't touch the ground, it'll get lost behind the rest of this tree. That'll be a neat little effect. They'll get smaller and smaller as you move into the background till eventually they just get lost. We're trying to avoid pattern Remember, if they all look the same, it's going to look awkward. Trying to find little openings and darker spots up top to add them in as well. Okay. There we go. Love that. Do you remember maybe half an hour ago when I was talking about not getting discouraged because it looked really awkward? Here we go. It's turning out. I'm sure yours is as well. Have faith in yourself. With some time and effort, you can do it. You can make something you're really proud of, that you really love. It might take a couple of attempts. You can, and you will get there. Again, as I noted, I previously painted all of this, covered it up, came back, this is my second time. Sometimes it does take a second time, and that's okay. There we go. That said, I feel like I'm talking like it's the end of the painting. We are so far from the end of the painting. Uh, I'm a little concerned that this might be a very long lesson, but maybe, maybe that's just what it calls for. With that, I think I'm pretty happy with the amount of branches we have. So I think it's time for our next step. Okay, so stepping back, I really like the amount of detail we have in there. I don't think we need to add any more. If we do anything in addition to this area, it'll be slightly more tapped on detail with one of the uh, more stiff bristled brushes, 
Or additionally, this should be later on, we could do a warmer glaze over all of it to kind of unify it and make it a bit more whole. Though that is something I would want to do later in the painting depending upon how other things kind of shape up. With that, we are going to move into the water here. We will be using the one inch flat headed brush because it is such a large area. And water is often just the reflection of what we see above, which here will be the sky, but in addition, some of the trees that kind of peek over this spot. Now I am going to start with uh, kind of a purple, like what we have up here in the clouds, and that'll be the majority of the pigment through that with the exception of the uh, actual trees. So. I'm going to begin with a lot of titanium white, and unfortunately, we have covered up our mixture for the purple. So we'll do it from scratch. We'll grab maybe an eighth, maybe a tenth of that in our purple from before, an eighth, maybe a tenth of our blue. Mix that up quite well. We'll go in with maybe a twelfth of that in Mars Black. I'm being very, very careful, really as careful as one can be. And I'll do a little test up here on the actual cloud. That is far too bright. So let's double up the amount of purple and blue that we have. While they will saturate it, they will also darken it. Go in for a little test. We are very close. Hint of Mars Black. And I think that'll bring us there. Though, it's worth noting that water is often, while a reflection, slightly darker than the subject it's reflecting. So, we just double up that Mars black, and that looks fantastic. Okay, so, heading into this, we are going to start on the edges, because remember, when you first grab pigment, you have the most opportunity to render a very sharp, intentional line. So we are just getting all of those out of the way here first. Work that back. Doing a couple layers and applications. Now the edges will soon be a reflection, but before that, I am going to apply this and we'll apply the reflections on top of this mixture here. So now we work into the open and make this a lot larger. We will need to do a couple of layers and I think I might make this one a little bit darker than what it currently is in layer number two. Though we aren't going to go all the way down, going to look for essentially where the rocks start in the reference photo and in the drawing. And right as we get there, I'm going to do a soft blend. So I can do a wet into dry blend later on with a slightly different color. One with more blue, that's a bit darker. Because we move from essentially this purple up into this more natural blue and the higher we get, the blue should get a bit of a darker value. So that is layer number one, and we'll do layer number two. We could again wait for it to dry. Wouldn't be a bad idea, but that layer wasn't all that thick. And so I think we can do layer number two much earlier than we normally could. I'm going for a darker mixture. So I'll leave some of the initial mixture up top there just so I have it as a good reference point. Probably have too much Mars Black. That's really pretty. That's nice. It's not a dramatic change, but it doesn't need to be. Okay. It appears the bottom layer has in fact dried, which means we won't be fighting the previous mixture. Applying a lot more pressure with my brush, but when I want to smooth it out, I lessen the pressure. Because remember, the more pressure generally means you'll push pigment to the sides of the bristles and create something that's unintentionally 
a bit stroke heavy. There we go. So, what's next? Reflections. Let's start with a little bit of our red. Grab our cadmium red, move that to a dry spot on our palette. Normally I say clean, but we seem to have lost that, so we'll start mixing right here. We'll grab about a third of that in our Naples yellow, which will desaturate it, but brighten it a little bit. Grab a hint, maybe a fifth, yeah, about a fifth of our cadmium yellow light here. We'll do a little look there. We need some titanium white and Mars black just to desaturate it. There we go. And for this, we'll start here. Apply it to the edge where it'll be reflecting down from. And then very soft, I will move down from that application. And the goal is to have it blend with our previous application and dissipate as you move farther down into the bluish purple. So I'm just going over it a couple times there. You can see that I missed a little bit of an area and then it got prominent again. In that scenario, we'll go back, we'll go back, grab that purple, work it up. go. Going to clean my brush relatively well. As this dries, we'll have to start working wet into dry. So, we now see some yellow, we see some more red. Let's continue with the red for this area, for this tree specifically. And now we'll go back, do a little bit of the yellow. We'll mix that right beside. We'll end up with a bit of an orange, but the actual reflection will have a bit of a blend in it, so it makes a bit more sense anyway. And then we have that orange right there that we can work in. Being very soft with this, because if I applied a lot of pressure, I'd get these prominent streaks that I'm not really looking for. By the way, <laughs> just looked in the viewfinder, we are back at the point where it will look awkward for a little while. You need not worry. I'm going to continue some of the orange as again we'll get blends between the reds and the yellows. Trying to lift my brush off with very little pressure as we move down into the blue. We'll go over here and do this now. There's going to be quite a bit of layering with this reflection. So, do be aware that it's not going to be the quickest process, but I think in the end, much like the backing trees, it'll turn out really nicely. Kind of lining the edges of our land masses a little bit here. Good. Now we'll grab more of a natural yellow, even mixture of our Naples, our cadmium, and our titanium white. My brush wasn't cleaned fully, so this mixture here will have a little bit of orange, but only a natural amount. I don't want the reflection to be too stark or too much of a perfect copy of the top, the water is moving a bit. And that's actually something important to note. When your water is perfectly still, you'll have a perfect glass-like reflection, but when the water is moving, you'll normally just see colors that are similar to that of what's on the top. Again, be it a little bit 
be it uh, a little bit darker. We don't have any green in here yet, but we'll get there as well. Have to be careful with the yellow moving over the blue. That can just turn into a green, unprompted, unintentionally. But we can we can be careful and mitigate that. Here I'm going in with a very watery mixture and just trying to blend some of my yellows and oranges together. And I can tell in the reference photo that the reflection, I suppose because of the slight movement in the water uh, of the oranges here, really goes down like that. And this one goes down all the way here as well. I don't know if I want to do that in the painting. It's one of those situations where you really have to consider your artistic liberties. If you copy exactly what's in the photo, does it look correct? Sometimes what is actually photographed, despite the fact that it is correct, doesn't necessarily look it. So a bunch of questions we have to ask ourselves in these, uh, in these scenarios. But I know that I do want to extend it slightly farther down in the very least with a bit more of a soft look. So the goal and the way of going about that is making a much more watery mixture We go back up to the top and then we come down with as little pressure as we possibly can. There we go. It's all about patience. So now we'll clean our brush. And we'll go back to more of our purple. So, purple, blue, titanium white, Mars black. And I know I'm not being as, uh, might not be as shatty for a minute, but we're getting to that stage where we need to focus a little bit more though I will explain to the best of my abilities what we're going to do. Here I am just looking for perhaps just a slightly darker variant of what we were working with. There we go. Working our way up. My brushes slightly dirty from the oranges that we were working with. And I can tell that it's diluting the purple a little bit, but it's actually a really nice thing. It's making it a bit warmer. And now we're going to do a bit of a blend up into these oranges. Wet into somewhat wet, somewhat dry. There we go. It's actually working. Love it. You can see that the transitions are getting softer. Now that that's all wet, we can head back to our oranges. There we go. Oh, that's so nice. Okay. So we just worked back and forth until we got a wet into wet. And the purples are bleeding into the oranges. The oranges are bleeding into the purple. It's not going down as far as in the reference photo, for those of you who are printed that out, did all of that. But still really pretty. Okay. And I like the slight movements in the water a lot. Now, I think I'm just going to clean this up a little bit. Might get a little quiet. Apologies. I really do try to speak as frequently as I can so that I can give you new information through the entirety of the lesson. Sometimes 
we have to work somewhat hastily to accommodate the quick drying time of our paint. As I noted, there was this orange that really extended in the reference photo right there, and I was hesitant to do it, but now that we're getting that nice wet into wet, I think it's actually working really well. You can see some slight start and stops, but that's okay. I'm going to go in with a tap of the corner of my brush and move some of the oranges into the blues and some of the blues into the oranges. Get a slight texture and movement. It's incredibly subtle. You might not even be able to see it on camera. But I'm trying to make this area as captivating as we can without doing anything dramatic in terms of hue or value. You can hear the <laughs> easel bouncing around a little bit. That's funny. Oh, that's exactly what I wanted. So that was the technique. Sometimes you have to find it. Every painting's different. Even if you're painting water, as the sun sets, it's going to look different 100 out of 100 times. So here, to kind of recap the general application style that took place, we did the purple. We did some of the orange on top, slight blend down, thicker paint. Then we went back and we did a second layer of that, slightly more watery. Then we went and we added the blue and we worked vertically upwards to blend it together. Then we kind of went back and forth between the oranges, bringing them down, bringing the blues up. And then we did a little bit of a tap with the side of the brush to create some light texture and movement for the water. Alternatively, some people just do prefer having the mirrored image in the water, and I, I very much respect that. If that's the aesthetic you're looking for, it means it's a bit more of a calm day, right? Less wind. You're more than welcome to just do an exact duplicate down here, should you want to. But really like this technique and what we ended up getting. Okay. Great. So... With that, <laughs> time for the, uh, the next step. Now this next step is to be done with a much smaller brush, that being the small liner brush. We're going to look at the mixture that we have here, grab some titanium white, interject that in, make something only slightly brighter. We really don't want a dramatic change, at least for the first application. And then we're going to head into the back and we're going to make a litany of very small horizontal strokes which will go over our reflection to a point but we want it to stay for the most part in the middle of our water. I can tell that I want it to be slightly brighter so we'll add a little bit more of that titanium white. Again we add it in the smallest amounts possible there we go. Work it in the middle. We'll start coming down. You're going to want your brush to be quite watery for this. That way you can make as small a marking as you'd like. Finding that. I add a little bit too much water, in which case it actually makes a larger marking. So there's a balance, but we do want it to be fairly damp. And then we find ourselves coming towards this larger opening, at which point we will expand out in all directions. And eventually this is going to dissipate and stop. We don't want to go overboard with it. 
but it can be a really nice distant detail that adds a lot to the piece. There we go. You can tell that the sky is brighter right underneath all of these clouds, so the reflection back here should be brighter. And this is a really nice way of going about it. It's not just a simple gradient, it has some texture. It's much more alive. It also, again, highlights the wind. This is, it, it's worth noting, this is only something you should do if you're not going for the perfect reflection, the mirrored one, because this does imply wind and it does conflict with the mirrored effect. Different things to consider. And again, I uh, try really hard in these not to just teach you how to do what I'm doing, but also why we're doing it. And right now it's to better mirror the sky, better imply a windy day. Better add detail to an open area that would have otherwise been void of it and requires it through texture and texture alone. One of those things we take quite some time with, but definitely pays off. Eventually, when we're close to the bottom, we'll be doing this with a much darker color. Much darker than this. But, it takes a little while to get there. There. You can see how large that is? That's because I have too much water on my brush. So we'll just take that off, go back to our palette. This might still have too much, we'll see. Do a couple applications. Spread them out. As we get into this larger open pool, we are not going to be painting these as tightly together as we previously did. They're going to expand and open up so you have more space vertically between them and horizontally too, but vertically is important, more so than horizontally. Going over some of my favorite ones. Because our applications are so watery, they're very transparent. So the color that's underneath them will become even more prevalent as it dries. So if you really like a certain application or you want an area to stand out, you have to go over it a couple of times. And in between those applications, you do need to let it dry. There we go. Just letting my pigment run out as I move down towards the bottom. You can see as it dries, it really just blends into everything else that we have. It's not something I want to overdo, but it's working well. Again, really trying to jump around. So again, while I don't like to cut in these lessons, we did continue doing that for quite a long period of time. Figured probably wasn't best to include an additional half an hour into the uh, lesson, essentially just doing the same thing over and over. But as you can see, over time we built up this to be a bit brighter and it dissipates as we move out. And it was just done through adding those little taps and drags. Something else you can do is just grab a little bit of it on your fan brush and then drag it out like that, like that. It's a little bit more risky. You have less control, but if you find that doing so with the smaller liner brush becomes tiring, that is an option as well. So 
with that, I think it's going really nicely, but there is still a piece of the reflection yet to be accomplished, that being the reflection of the grass, right? This is raised out of the water to a point. So we're going to go to our liner brush. This one's a little bit bigger than the one that we work on with a lot of the detail, but I'll grab some of my sap green, Mars black, titanium white, going to start us off a bit farther away from the canvas, that way you can see how large it is in context with everything else and the general coloring. And I'm just going to work this all the way along our edge through a series of very small tap and drags. This is essentially the separation and the dip. We wanted to get smaller as you move this way because you're going farther and farther away from us and perspective is going to make it look smaller and smaller. We're not going to be doing it over through here simply because it's too far away, but we can do it just a little bit right over here. There we go. Now we need to create a bit of a brighter green that matches essentially what we have there. So more of our green, some titanium white, Want to make it a bit warmer, a bit more yellow. So we'll throw in the Naples yellow, go in for a little bit of a test. That looks really nice. But it's a reflection, so it needs to be darker than the actual grass, right? Back to some Mars black to do that. Do a little test on the reference photo, and perfect, okay. So I'm going to apply this underneath that darker application that we have. Doesn't have to be perfect. You can have portions of the orange or the bluish purple of the water showing through. There we are. And now I will get you closer for the actual blending part of the process. So the goal is to use a fairly damp brush, go to that bottom portion, and we just want to blend down very softly, wet into dry. So we just want the pigment essentially to dissipate as we move farther and farther down, because it's not actually going to be able to blend with the dry paint, but it can visually do so through that gradient and through the use of a little bit more water. Something else we can do is remix the colors that we have in here and bring them up into that grass. My favorite area I think is right here and it's just a bit softer. So I'm going to grab some of our titanium white, a little bit of our blue maybe. Yeah. Mars black bit more. And we'll just work that into the water, into the surrounding areas. Nice little addition. We can remix some of our orange. So red, yellow, be careful with the yellow if you just used blue. Titanium white. Maybe a little bit more red. And we're kind of just going back and forth with the colors at hand until we have something that looks nice and natural. I think this area is still too dark in general. It needs to be darker than the grass, but it doesn't need to be a black or anything too close to it. We'll save those really dark values for what we have in the foreground. Go back to the green. Maybe in these areas we can do just a little bit more stretching out. And then where we have this nice golden 
sunlight coming in on the grass, we can recreate that to a point over this little dip in reflection, right? And they can just kind of dissipate as we move out into the water. Yeah, I like that a lot. So much of painting is trial and error. Just trying to figure things out. And that's fun. Makes it like a puzzle. And very rewarding when we get to the answers and stages we want. Have a lot going on with this reflection now in very subtle ways. And I think that works extremely well for it. Now we're going to begin working on the bottom portion of our water and connecting that up to the top portion. I will be using the one inch flat headed brush and we will be heading back to our ultramarine blue to begin things off. Everything on my palette has fully dried. It is actually the next day, so I don't have to worry about that. We'll grab a little bit of titanium white and Mars black, starting with my general third, which seems to be the default. I'll do a little test on the reference photo, and I like it, but it could be a little bit brighter. Hint more of titanium white. Maybe one fifth this time. And I'm going to do a little application down here, see if I like it. I think that'll actually work quite nicely, at least for the first layer. If we feel like we need to make it darker, we can do that a little bit later on. And as you can see, I am rotating the brush to work around all of the rocks that we have over on the left hand side. Again, if you need help with the drawing process there, the traceable is up over on Patreon. Great way to support the channel if you can and get some fun benefits like that of the reference photos, traceables, all of my ebooks access to our exclusive Facebook group. Bunch of fun stuff. But you can also just copy it off the video. Nice and easy. With that, my initial mixture, as you can see here, is quite watery. So my applications are rather thin, which means we'll have to go back with at least a second layer. But Again, I wasn't entirely sold on the color to begin with, so going in with something a little bit more thin and a little bit less finite was, I think, definitely the safer move. If you're ever unsure about a color, an application, anything of that nature, recognize that you don't have to commit a lot of paint initially. You can test it and then solidify a little bit later on. You can also use a smaller brush for working around this area. I personally feel like the corners of the one inch flat headed are nice and sharp enough to allow me to articulate the brush within the space well enough, but if you do find it difficult, you are more than welcome to start working with a smaller brush, particularly in those spaces. We're using the one that we are because it's allowing us to work on a larger area with a wet into wet technique which would be difficult with a smaller brush because things would just dry really quickly before we could really cover all of it. That said, this is looking good, but we do need it to transition into that. So we'll grab some of our purple, equal mixture of our blue, a lot more titanium white. We're looking to mix something akin to what we have over on the side here but with a hint more blue. So we'll go and re-interject that blue. The blue darkened it, so we need to brighten it yet again. We'll add titanium white. Go in for a test. 
And as I noted, this is the next day. So, all of this paint is fully dry, which means I'm going to need to do a wet and to dry technique. So I'm going to take all of the paint, or at least most of it off my brush, make my brush fairly damp. And now I can just bring this very watery mixture up into the rest of the painting. It's not perfect, and we will have to go back, but it's a good first step. Though, we do now need to transition our blue into our lighter pigment, so we'll go ahead and do that. As you can see, the blue is starting to dry right there. So we'll mix up a bit more relatively quickly with a little bit of haste. And by the way, in these scenarios where things are drying, don't get concerned or worried in the moment. Again, we're working with acrylics. They're very forgiving. We can always go back and cover things up should we need to. It's just such a malleable medium and so forgiving. So don't worry or rush yourself. If you're not ready to work at a quick speed, let's say okay. I'm really getting a lot of layering in through this process. Oh, I actually like that better than the previous mixture. That's nice. Okay, now we're going to approach that top area yet again. I'm going to actually mix elsewhere, and we're just going to recreate the exact purplish blue that we have there. So very minor amounts of our blue and our purple, a little bit of Mars black to darken and desaturate in conjunction with the titanium white. Do a little test. It's good for the highlight, but it's not dark enough. Yet again, mix it up. And we'll work with very minor amounts of Mars Black every time, just because it's such a strong pigment. I think we need a little bit more purple. It's looking a little too desaturated now. We kept darkening it, but of course, that meant we were actually desaturating it as well. It's all about finding that proper balance. So here we go in, a little test. Working it along the side, slowly working it down. It's a little bit darker than what we have in a lot of the highlighted areas, which is actually good. Makes it a better transitionary color as we move into a darker space. And we can go back to the colors that we were previously using and which were previously working. And now it's all wet onto wet. I'll get you a little bit closer for the finer detail. So as we get closer, we can see how things look a little bit better. We'll add a little bit of titanium white to that slightly darker mixture. And I'll start Around the center, where we have the brightest amounts of light, we'll start tapping that on with a little bit of a drag to the left and the right, just using the corner of the brush, not really using all that much. I'm going to take some of that extra paint off my brush, that way it dissipates as we move downwards and create a much more natural transition between the two. And the closer we get to us, the larger the movements in the water are going to be. So at this point, I'm going to start creating more elongated markings. And they're not always going to be perfectly straight. Sometimes they're going to move up or down. We are approaching rocks in the foreground that sit just under the water, but the water moves on top of them. And as it moves on top, that top portion gets a little bit of a highlight from light, and that is essentially what we're painting right now. So there's a little bit of a rock under here. It protrudes, the water moves over it. Said protrusion gets that highlight, and we get that detail. 
Again, it's important to not only know the technique you're using, but why you're using it. Does it fit within the context of the, the scene that you're painting? Right? So here, it starts to get quite noticeable, just the difference in value between the current purple and the blue. And we are just about at the point where we should probably switch to a darker pigment, but before we do, I'm just going to go to that transitionary area, a little bit higher up, make sure that transition is nice and smooth. And not in the way of having a perfect gradient, but just a natural transition. And I'm just taking this highlight a little bit higher up to normalize it slightly more. And the more we go over these areas with a very soft touch, a little bit of a damp brush, not much paint on it, the more we end up getting a bit more filled in look that's similar to what we have above. Though I do like the little tapped details, so it's about finding that balance. So as we step back, we can see a slight change there between the two, but I actually really like this as a transition. It looks natural, but if you want something that is a bit more of a softer transition ingredient, you can just take more of the highlights that you used through the predominantly central area here and incorporate them down into this. It should over layers really build up something that's uh, a bit more smooth in its transition. But again, I like what we have and we are going to move on to this bottom portion where I am switching to the liner brush as we are going to be working with quite a bit of detail. Make sure that's nice and wet. And here we have our previous mixture color for that. We're going to make it a bit more blue for the transition. So we'll throw that in there. That will also darken our pigment, which is good. Also something we need to do in this process, but it's much more saturated than what we really want it to be right now. So we're going to add a little bit of titanium white and a little bit of Mars black. Not much of either. We'll take off the excess paint because said paint after mixing is generally very difficult to work with due to its abundance. We'll grab our pigment and we'll head down into this area where again we'll have lots of little rocks and highlights built upon said rocks. It'll initially look a little strange in that we've been working predominantly with all of these horizontal lines and very small ones and now we're going to be transitioning into something that has a bit more playfulness and, and movement. So there are going to be larger rocks which render big applications like that and they can connect and then it comes down but on the other side here we can also have smaller rocks so that's plenty of little taps and it kind of creates this little valley and then we can have another big one which is cut off by another there can be one in between these two. Just looking up at the reference photo, making sure that we have the right general idea. I'm not copying it line for line right now, but rather taking the general transitions and wider ideas. Now here, we're going to get it so that there's a lot of larger rocks transitioning out this way, cutting off that little valley that we created. And then it can get a little bit more choppy over here. So I'll reinforce some of these larger ones because we are working with acrylics. These first applications are going to be quite transparent, we'll need to go over them a couple of times, and I am showing it to you from a bit of a distance right now, just so you can see how it transitions as a, as a whole. We will get you closer in just a second though, where you can see 
the details as well. Okay, I think we're at the point where we move you a little bit more inwards. So, here we can see the detail a little bit better. And as we start to move this way, we're going to change the general direction and movement of these highlights to be wrapping around rocks that move the line work a bit more diagonally up towards the left as you can see with these markings right here. And this is all going to change depending upon the orientation of the rocks and the little pools of water that are channeled from the rocks in the general direction. So if we have larger rocks here, the water is going to be pushed that way, it's going to be pushed this way, and then it's going to move on top of the ones that we are currently rendering. And I know it seems strange to be talking about rocks when we're just painting bumps in water, but that's really what's creating all of this change. There we go. We can also make some of these applications with a larger brush, should you want it to be a little bit less detailed, and we may go back and change some of it with a filber brush later on in the lesson, but for now, I think I'm quite happy. Though we will need to go back and do secondary layers to the tops of some of the more prominent movements to give us some added depth. And we will need to take a couple of steps back and really check our work before we decide to move on. Because while it may look nice up close, there's a chance that when we move back, It'll just look a little too visually complicated, or too visually simple, right? Could go either way. So make sure that throughout the painting process you are taking those steps back, and ensuring your piece is looking the way you want it to. So upon stepping back, I do feel like the markings are a little bit too finite. I, I want something that feels more fluid, and by applying larger strokes, we can make applications and the visual less rigid, which will add to that more flowy nature that we want. So, I've switched to our Filbert brush here, and this one is great because it has softer corners for blending, but still a sharp top for when we do want to render those more clean lines. I'll make sure it's a little bit damp, we'll grab our pigment, and I'll be able to create much larger markings within here. So I'm going to go over a lot of the previous ones, amalgamating them, and I'm beginning with the ones that are closest to us, and then working my way out. Looks like my mixture is a little bit darker than it was before, but that's okay. Realistically, as we get closer to us with this particular subject, I'm happy if we tend to lose contrast rather than gain it. There we go. Good start. We'll work it up a little bit more, grab some extra water. And this is moving water. So all of the fun little extra changes in color, transitions, can add some good unique depth and show that the water's running in an interesting way without necessarily expressing all of that detail through actual mark making, which is really what we are attempting to accomplish here. So I'm continuously going over different spots, building it up, as you can see, to a large degree. 
And now we can work reductively, should we want to, mix up a bit of a darker blue. So ultramarine, equal amount of Mars black, a little bit less than half that in titanium white, maybe a little bit more of our blue. We want this to be a relatively rich, darker blue. That is really nice. And you can go back and work that in between some of the previous applications. So definitely do so with more water than what I was using there. Just going to make things look a little bit deeper. Let's go for more of a transition again. More blue, more titanium white. And if anything, I'd like this portion of the lesson to reinforce the idea that we don't just have to go in with the first color we mix or the first application. Often, continuously going back, reworking, adding layers, changing your hue slightly to adapt to a changing situation can be very beneficial. That said, you don't have to do all of this if you liked your version right after we use the liner brush. Again, it's so much personal preference, painting, art, so subjective. But the more I work this, the more I really like it. I'm going to grab a little bit of the darker pigment, work that over here again. There we go. Now, back to a highlight. Further reinforce a couple that we've made over here. Soft blend backwards. Love it. Really love it. Getting quiet as I focus, as I do tend to do occasionally. Lots of rocks underneath there. Now I thought one more time we'd go back in, but I'd use my liner brush and we'd just tap on the smallest hints of movement in the water into the larger ones. And this is something that normally you do with ocean waves to give them a lot of extra life. But it's just a little horizontal marking. Sometimes there's a little bit of a curvature to it. But it's going to add a lot of great detail to what we're doing. When we're working with the filbert brush, we ended up amalgamating a lot of different pieces, bringing them together, simplifying. And that was good. That was what it needed, in my opinion. But now we have an opportunity to just go ahead and add some extra nice clean applications. Water moving slightly. on top of the larger moments. Lots of little taps and drags. We don't want to overdo it, but I think when we pull back from this step right here, it's going to look really nice. And then I have a couple truly bright highlights, which I wanted to save. for balancing purposes. There we go. Sometimes a little rock may protrude from the water and you can just paint 
the hint of the top of it with a little bit of a glisten. So I'm just finding where those rocks might be. Now, something I would like to take a minute to note is that initially we intended to paint all of the rocks fully submerged. Obviously that's something we just changed. And I think the rocks here are much more visible than what they are in the reference photo, but I really like that look. I feel like it gives it a little bit of additional depth. It gives us the idea that maybe you could walk out barefoot into the water. Uh, probably a little cold to go for a swim at this point uh, in fall, but Still, I, I really like how it can take you on a bit of a journey. And so the larger, I guess, lesson here is don't be afraid to take your painting in other directions if you feel like it's just happening naturally, you're inspired, it's working, and it still makes sense within the context of the painting. This water is running, it's moving, but as we get to these more shallow areas, especially where you can actually see little bits of rock, it is okay and it does make sense to calm down that water to the point where you can slightly see maybe some little rocks underneath. And again, those started as us painting movements in water, not even rocks. They just kind of naturally occurred uh, through inspiration. And again, you're more than welcome to paint it exactly like the reference photo. You're more than welcome to follow along with exactly what I did. You're more than welcome to take it in your own direction. Just remember that you're working on your piece and you are welcome to do with it what you wish. That said, it's time for our next step. Now, while the rocks are really inspiring me, the next thing we need to do is work on the little pathway that we have between our rocks and our foliage because we're going to apply a lot of our rocks on top of it and it'll just be a lot easier to layer. With that, I'm going to be going back in with the filbert brush because it can pick up a decent amount of paint and it'll be good for maneuvering around the space. I am going to be using some burnt umber yet again some burnt sienna, probably some Naples yellow as long with our white and our black, but we'll start with said burnt umber. We'll warm it up with an even mixture of our burnt sienna. Then we'll slightly desaturate it, but also brighten it with our Naples yellow. And then we'll return it to a darker pigment with our Mars black. We'll go in with a little test on the reference photo. Looks good and we'll head down here. Though, when I apply it, because my pigment is quite thin due to water, you can see what thin pigment looks like in relation to uh, more of a thick application. This is the pigment that we want, but because our brush is so wet, I think I'm actually going to darken the pigment a little bit. Yeah, and this will be a much better pigment to build on top of. So it's still fairly thin, but because it's darker, the white canvas that's showing through underneath isn't as prominent. We will need to do two layers, but this is definitely the correct starting color. I am painting over the edges of quite a few rocks. I'm not worried about that. When we paint our rocks, we can go over the land, and this is essentially the reason why we decided to paint in the order that we did. Just go back down here for a second. Grab more of our pigment, work our way upwards. Filbert brush really doing a great job with the sharp top, being able to work around these very finite spaces. We're going to have a lot of foliage and rocks up here, so we don't need to do anything in that area, but while it's not necessarily present in the reference photo, I'm going to add a little bit more land in this spot and above it so that we have a good area to apply foliage on top of. Realistically, what I'm about to apply probably won't be seen at all in the final painting, but it'll ensure that our future layers look quite strong. There we go. And now we can go back to our second layer, just like that. It's all very wet at this point, so we can go in with a bit of a highlight if we want. In the reference photo, you have a lot more of this organic uh, root-like, maybe a mossy texture in this general vicinity. 
We're not going to do that. We're going to go with more of a traditional path simply so that we have a bit more of an inviting area that you feel like you can walk into. I, I do really like that with a lot of my pieces. And I'm going to continue mixing with the filbert, but I'll apply with the half inch flat headed brush. We're going to create a brighter mixture, grab some titanium white, grab an equal amount of our Naples yellow, about a third of our burnt umber, third of our burnt sienna. And now we have this nice, warmer, beautiful color that won't actually look exactly like this on the palette or on the, <laughs> on the canvas, simply because we'll be blending and working with this, but I'm going to go in with some horizontal strokes, some taps, and just create a nice little textured walkway here. There's a little bit of a drag, but not much. Have it dissipate as you move into the background. It's just going to make it a little bit more interesting. And we'll throw it into here with a less pigment. There we go. Now to solidify things, we'll go back in with a filbert, pick some larger areas, different potential mounds of dirt that protrude, stick up a little bit, catch slightly more light, cast a shadow on their back half. So we're using a lot of the same application techniques that we used in the water, in the trees, but because of the variance of color and slight variance of technique, we're able to get something that looks like a different subject and a little bit more unique. There we go. It's all softening out. Looking quite good. I'm applying next to no pressure. Almost none. There we go. Now that we have all of that applied and fully dry, we can continue using the filbert brush and start working on our rocks. Now, the base layer is going to be a bit cooler. We're going to add some warmer hues to the highlights so that it'll definitely feel a bit more diverse and that way the shadows feel like a, they add good contrast to the highlight. But with that, I'm going to start with some Mars Black. We'll grab about two thirds of that in ultramarine blue one sixth that in titanium white. You know what, maybe, maybe we'll double up the titanium white. Yeah, that right there looks great. It's a nice, cool, not black, but darker hue. And we'll go in and we'll just start applying this to the base of where all of our rocks are going to be. So, we have quite a few that are still very visually notable here. We're going to ignore the distinctions between them at this point in time. We can re-interject that later in the painting process. We'll be using the top of the brush to render sharper edges like that. And again, it really is ideal to do that when you grab paint for the first time. Some rocks will just be sitting out in the water, though we will have to go back and add a slightly submerged version of them in those scenarios. That way, where the water is partially see-through, and it is to a point, the rocks are notable. We do have rocks out here. This one's kind of neat. 
They're not all going to be triangular, they're not all going to be rectangular. We're looking for as many unique shapes as we can find within the rocks. And that'll create the best piece in the end. Here I start with very small ones and I slowly expand. I'm just looking up at the reference photo to see what the general movements are. Of course, again, if you're up on Patreon, you can use the traceable and just copy it exactly. I might pause and draw them in at some point too if I ever feel like I'm just not getting exactly what I want. We'll have a smaller rock up here, though this might be better achieved with a liner brush. And for the rocks that you do want to be quite small, the liner brush is definitely what I would personally advise in those scenarios. There we go. Okay. Now we definitely need more pigment, so blue, black, and titanium white. We want slightly more titanium white than we initially expected. And I really like how we have little patches of water showing through different portions of our rock. I think that creates a neat distinction. We're also going to be covering up the majority of our path here. But it was important to paint in its entirety so that we had opportunity and room to take portions out, right? Here I'm also going to go over a couple of spots numerous times just to sharpen edges and build up our layers. go. I'm going to move the camera a little bit farther back just so you can get a better idea of the general sizing of everything. So here we have a wider shot just for some additional visual context, but I'm going to start bridging the gap between the left and the right hand side rocks right through here. Again, covering up a lot of the ground. We didn't spend a lot of time on the ground. Again, knowing that this was essentially the goal, and I think that's okay. We put it down, we had it where we needed it, we gave ourselves some room and option to play, and now we can in fact do set playing. So, I can tell that there's a rock right here in the photo, and then it moves up into a larger one. Again, I am taking some liberties, but... That will be a good little cluster of rocks. We have another one here. They're essentially lining the edge to a point with slight openings and divots. There we go. I'll leave some of that ground showing through should I want it to show through the foliage. And then as you move up here, I think we're just going to create the edge of our rocks have it tie back in. There we are. Nice and easy. This is all going to be foliage, so we don't have to bring that up any higher. But I am going to make these protruding rocks look a little bit more interesting. Just like that. Don't have to do too much. Though we should go back and do a second layer over most of these, just to ensure that they are nice and sharp. Now that we have our base layer applied, we're going to start defining our individual rocks. And we'll do so with our liner brush. This one's a little bit bigger, but you're welcome to use a smaller one as well. We're going to start by creating a nice warmer hue. So the light that's coming down and hitting them from that right hand side. We'll start with an even mixture 
of our burnt sienna and our Naples yellow. Grab a little bit of our titanium white, probably about a third of what we were working with, and then about a third of our Mars black, which will darken it quite dramatically, but that is what we want at this point. So, with that, I'm going to say, okay, light's coming in this way, that means the tops and the right-hand side of our rock, or rocks, is going to get a nice highlight. So, let's pick a rock and start defining it. A lot of my applications are going to be done through a plethora of strokes here. That way, the rock looks bumpy and like it has some texture. And here, I'm going to start making this rock more unique by giving it essentially a wall. So it doesn't just curve down, it essentially has this flat area which the light hits and makes it a bit more interesting. Now we can create another rock through here that has a similar slope you can see it's quite a bit of a drop-off, and that's very different from that more linear application that we have going on right there. That said, we've now used the same pigment, same hue, for quite a few different rocks. So we're going to spread it out just a little bit. I'll pick one more. And then before we start on our next rock, we will adjust color. There we are. That said, before we move off of this color, we will grab our half inch flat headed brush, grab some of that, and tap on a little bit of texture. So we used the liner brush to shape it and to bring light to the areas that were entirely necessary, and then we used this brush to add in some additional texture that isn't defining in terms of actual shape. So we'll put that brush down and it looks like it's getting quite bright outside. So I'm going to adjust to the lighting on the camera and then we'll proceed. That should be a little bit better. Now the next mixture is going to be quite a bit more warm red. So we'll start with our burnt sienna. Grab an equal mixture of our cadmium red medium hue an equal mixture of our Naples yellow. So the difference here is just the cadmium red at this point. Then we'll grab about a third, yet again, of our titanium white. Work that in there. And then we'll grab about a fifth, maybe less. You know what? Let's go, let's go with an eighth of our Mars black. So this really can be quite a bit of a step above what we were previously working with. So, this is where that light's really going to be coming in. It's going to look really nice against a lot of our blues. So I'm going to start with some of our rocks that are more out near the water. Now because we are going with such a bright pigment here and one with a fair amount of saturation, we are now inevitably going to have to go back to our previous application and build up the highlights. It's one of the reasons why I feel like we're almost never finished with a subject until we get to the end of the painting. Adding in a new subject can dramatically change what we need to do with previous ones. I'm trying to vary this, so I'm jumping around a lot. Again, always trying to create new shapes, keeping in mind the general idea and rule that the right hand side of the rock and the top are going to be the most bright. I put my brush there thinking, should we do that one? No. Should we do that one? No, it's a little too close to the others. So we'll move back and we'll work on this one. This is something that should be fairly prominent. We'll make it large. Then we'll have it get lost down there. And then we'll have the sister rock also adopting some of that highlight, doing a little bit of a tapping effect, though that will be better achieved later on with 
our other brush. I'm going to do a second application to the areas that are really going to be receiving light. So building up our levels and our values. I think we'll do another one. Just the top here. Looks like as we move farther down, there's a less and less light hitting this area. So we actually want to save the majority of the highlights for the top sections. There we go. And the area that's going to be the most bright is this top portion. You can see that there's a relatively straight rock, or at least it has a relatively straight top edge moving down diagonally, which I like a lot. So we'll work on that. And then again, this back area is getting the most light. So we'll incorporate a couple more. I have to be careful though, this shape and this shape are very similar. And that's something that can happen once or twice, but you really don't want to make it too much of a pattern. This one's a bit more angled, which is good. And I can bring back the edge so it kind of connects with this rock, making it a singular unit, which is interesting. Again, if you don't want to craft these yourselves, there's the traceable. That's good. It's doing really well. Okay, we definitely need to switch our color though. So what do we do before that? We grab our half inch, grab our pigment, go in with some texture. If you add too much texture, you can always go in with a darker pigment and tap that as well. If you feel you just create too much light in the subject. I don't think we're there with any of these. In fact, I think we need to add highlights to them a little bit later on, but something to consider. And you can also take this and just splash it elsewhere for later, once you have a very minute amount that won't conflict with other colors you may choose to use. So we, have a, we actually have a good opportunity here. And once this is done, we can continue crafting our rocks with a slightly augmented pigment. Next, I want to create more pink heavy rocks. So we'll start with our cadmium red medium hue. We'll mix beside our last mixture. That way we can compare through the mix. I'll grab some titanium white, about an equal mixture to our red. Then we need to make it a bit more earthy. So I'll grab about a third of our burnt sienna and a third of our burnt umber as well. And that right there definitely looks like what I'm looking for. So, perfect. We'll grab some of that, come in, start defining new rocks, and already you can see the difference between this one and this one. It's subtle, but it is present. And while we have this pigment and new pigment on our brush, We'll go back and render the smaller ones. That would be difficult once we started to run out of paint. While this is bright, there's also room to brighten it still, which is nice. It means we can build up the depth a little bit more. Still following my general rule of applying this to the tops and right hand side. Though I did break my rule, I did want the majority of this to get darker as we get towards the bottom. Perhaps we'll do that towards the left hand side. Just give it a bit more of a natural vignetta effect instead. There we go. 
There we go. I think this will look really great when we start tapping on the texture. Still just trying to get as creative as I can with the general movements. The different faces of the rocks, the different sizes. That's how this will come together in the best way. Going to disrupt this rock because I just felt like I had too much of a similar thing going on there. So I'll just kind of paint over that. Create a new one, I like that a lot more. Add a smaller rock down here. Maybe add some hints of this pink to our previous darker rocks that just didn't have the saturation that we needed. And we can add hints of our pink to the more orange rocks as well to further diversify them while also making the piece as a whole more cohesive. So we're really starting to jump around. But you can really tell how much more complete the more orange rocks and the original ones look with the, with the tapping. Okay. We're coming towards the back side and I'm not going to forget, we are going to make it darker as a whole. So I'm not going to do too much here. Just add a little bit of this highlight to the edge, have the little protruding areas come out, catch a little bit of light, allow it to dissipate on my brush as we start to move farther back. Have a little divot in the rock right at the top there. Create something unique but not too bright. Add a little bit of a highlight to the top of this one, but not much. We have next to nothing on our brush. And it is doing exactly what we want it to. And I can also use this to further elaborate on the distant area, which will probably be covered in foliage. We'll also use this opportunity to add a little bit of texture, but not much light to this rock, which again, much like these, needs to be darker. Good. So, put that brush down, pick up our half inch. And I'm going to spread this out. Do feel like you can take steps back in between this process. You don't want to overdo it. And from a distance, you will get a better idea of how it's all actually turning out. Okay. Now, we'll go in, create an even greater highlight, make it a mix of both our pink and our orange. We're adding a little bit of titanium white, a little bit of our Naples yellow, cad red, We'll add this to the tops and most prominent areas of the rocks which are really catching light and protruding out predominantly towards the distance and the background.
There we go. Let's get you a little bit closer for the final touches to a couple of these. It's also worth noting, I am really happy. <laughs> Sometimes we end up with rocks that make us happy, satisfied. Today, I really like the variety of colors. I really like our motions. I like the mixture of tapping texture with brush stroke. I think it all just came together extremely smoothly. And I think the larger takeaway here is that rocks are made through not one type of application or technique, but an amalgamation of them. And that rocks aren't just grays and browns. We have a lot of reflective light and colors that we can incorporate in them as well that'll really help make them special. If you just looked at this color on my palette, you probably wouldn't think that's a color for a rock, but when the sun is setting and you have that warm light coming in, it makes for great aid. There we go. Don't want to overdo it, so I'm going to put my brush down very soon, but there we essentially have our finishing touches to these for now. So now we can start filling in this larger area, which will be nice considering I did test some green in that uh, earlier in the lesson. But with that, we're going to start with a very dark green base that we can build both green highlights on top of as well as other warmer foliage. So we'll start with quite a lot of our Mars Black. We'll grab maybe one fifth that in our Sapa Green, and then we'll grab one-fifth that in our Naples Yellow just to warm it up slightly. We'll go in and give this a test, and I like it, but I feel like it's slightly too dark. I, I want it to be, in the very least, the same value as what we have in our rocks, so we'll double up on both the Sap Green and the Naples Yellow. And that is so much better. So normally I take my pigment off my brush before going in and actually painting as it can be difficult to work with such a pigment filled brush. However, we have a really large negative space to fill in and we don't need the edge of our brush or any sharp markings at this point. So I'm just getting the majority of this paint off the brush as we just don't need it right now. There we go. Go all the way to the edges, and I'll move you in closer for the next step. But I am going to take the extra paint off this brush, make it nice and clean so that we can work with some much more intentional applications. Now we'll just grab some of that pigment, but not too much, and along the edges we'll tap what will look like little individual protruding leaves. This is quite close to us in the foreground, so we will see individual leaves. We'll also see clusters sometimes, but creating little pieces like that will make for a really nice painting. Just going to ensure that I do cover up all of the white of the canvas. That's something we really don't want to show through. Can make it look unprofessional very quickly. Now again, this is going to overlap quite a lot, and I'm slowly expanding it out and upwards. The less is more technique I think is definitely ideal in these scenarios. And then we can have it work its way down over our rocks, in between our rocks. We can cut around particular rocks that we feel might be in front of, but this can also overlap rocks. Again, lots of rotating. 
And I know this probably looks darker than what we have in the dark values of the rock, but as it continues to dry and gets less reflective, it should actually look much more natural with what we already have established on the canvas. There we go. As per usual, we will want to do two layers, but I do still have some smaller foliage to apply up here. And hopefully by the time I'm done applying all of these little applications, the rest of it will have fully dried and I'll just be able to go in and paint that second layer really quickly. Though much like most of the second layers in this painting, I will do that off of camera just because you've seen me paint this flat area once already. And I'm sure this video will already be quite long. So again, just trying to give you all of the important information and at least one rendering of every subject. We can always use a smaller brush down here should we want to. It's fairly watery. There we go. Working its way out into the rocks. I like that a lot. Then we'll have lots of little branches come up through this spot too. Really looking forward to seeing this evolve. Little leaves. Smaller pieces of foliage. Just getting it with a bit of a tapping effect. Now we are eventually going to have to move up in the canvas and when we do, we will continue working with our filbert brush and the same mixture though, we're going to start to create different clusters that occur out throughout this. And I know that we need to continue off of where we were, but in the process of creating these clusters, we need to leave openings. So I'm holding my brush a bit farther back so that we get more of a randomized application style. I'm rotating my brush through those applications. And as you can see, we are being left with lots of nice little openings. That is certainly the goal. I'm going to make the top corner darker because we want a nice vignette effect, but I'm also going to leave an opening through here so that I can have some of our tree showing through in later steps. We are going to be working on the foliage first obviously. And we do that so that we can layer our branches as well as the tree trunk over top a lot of this. But we can also weave it in between previously applied foliage. So it's just much easier normally if you start with a foliage than the actual branches and whatnot. Just looking over at my phone, has the uh, reference photo. I also have it up there for testing colors, but sometimes being able to zoom in and all of that can be handy. With that, we need to expand this outwards and I'm going to do so in the most careful way I possibly can. <laughs> and that is by doing all of our expansions incredibly minimally with large openings to start. So again, lots of rotation, slowly working my way. In the reference photo, the tree comes out to about here. Am I going to have it go all the way out there? Potentially. We might take artistic liberties though and we might not want to. So we're painting from a bit of a distance and I'm even going to take another step back. Something we want to avoid is the very obvious duality that we have here. If this is the middle, then we have this trajectory line and this trajectory line. We want them to be different. So we definitely need to continue expanding here. We'll expand outwards. There we go. I do know that I want the top to protrude more than anything, but we can leave an opening as that can be a bit more interesting. 
than just having it be solid. So because we didn't want to mirror this exactly, we are expanding farther out. And let me actually back up the camera a little bit more for you. Back to the easel. Again, looking to make this a bit more unique. So I'm going to have a piece that I can see in the photo that kind of jets out of here. So it comes down and then it goes out and then it comes back in. And I like this because it kind of wraps itself around the trees in the background to a point without being too obvious about it. And it doesn't cover up too much of the actual trees. Though I will be covering up a bit more of them right through here. Really like that orange tree. I'd like to keep that if we have the opportunity. Maybe we can cover a little bit of it. Give us some depth, but still retain the subjects we love. That said, there is a really, really good lesson in covering up pieces that you do love to make the piece better. That does happen quite frequently in painting where you say, oh, I did, I did such a good job on this and you, you may have and you may love it, but the painting may be better compositionally or balance wise or the, the mood of it just might be better with a different subject overlapping or taking up that space. So just recognize that will happen and it is okay to kind of sacrifice elements that you do like the rendering of for other elements which will potentially aid the painting in a greater way. We're going to continue moving out here. And I think I want to make this feel a bit more full so I'm going to make this area more blocky, at least initially. And we've officially gone all the way out to where the reference photo suggested. So we did end up following it. Maybe we'll go farther though. <laughs> Yet to be determined. And again, I do want that to move out more. I love it when branches and leaves feel like they have a little bit of a falling effect after a certain point. So that's what I'm going to try to create here. They just have too much weight at the end. So we'll just have some smaller leaves handcrafted pointing downwards. There we go. Taking a step back, I like it. Again, fairly boxy, we'll change it slightly just to be a little bit less intuitive visually so the viewer and their eye has to stay on it for a longer period of time to really take in what's occurring. Okay, that worked really well. And I, I feel like this made a really big difference. <laughs> nice, to, uh, nice to see it all starting to work out here. I'm going to go over some of the areas we've previously applied that just weren't thick enough, but I'll be careful around our edges. And then once I'm done this, we'll let it dry and we'll head into our following step. By the way, I did leave an opening space here for some exposed portion of the tree. You don't have to do that. Um, in fact, you know what? I'm just going to cover that up. That way we have a little bit more freedom when we are crafting later. Now for this next step, we're going to be working on a lot of the foliage near the bottom, which is going to start with some greens and we'll move into some reds and oranges later, but we're going to do a lot of the application with a soft fan brush. And these are fantastic because unlike the stiff bristle fan brush, when wet, these bristles condense, so you have five or six points on your fan brush, and you can do some larger randomized taps which resemble leaves. So we will use that, but of course we will be doing our mixing with the one inch flat headed brush. I'll start by making sure that it is a little bit damp, wiping off the excess paint, and we'll head to our palette where we're going to mix a bit of a warmer green. A lot of the rocks down here have warmer light on them and we want to further complement that. So I'll start with some sap green here. We'll grab 
about one half that in our Naples yellow. It's going to brighten it, it's going to warm it. We'll grab one fifth that in our burnt sienna and we'll slowly add more burnt sienna until we feel we have a nice warmer, slightly more earthy green. So slowly just going back and forth and the interjection of this paired with the Naples yellow should bring us to something much more fitting with the colors that we have down here. And if you look at the green here in relation to that, I think that we are almost there. And of course, we can do a little test on the reference photo. It's a little bit brighter here, but I think I'm a big fan. And when we add water, of course, it'll be more semi-transparent that'll show through and it'll actually be darker. So here's our fan brush before water, dipping it in water, wiping off the excess, and here we have it after. Lots of little areas to make markings, but it's not as small or thin as the individual bristles like what we had with the stiff bristled fan brush. With that, I'm going to start on the edge here create some nice highlights, rotating my brush in the air, never on the actual canvas. We will aim to create varying sized clusters. We can have some of these work their way down into the rocks and ground area as well, and protrude out even farther than our silhouettes previously allowed us to. Now as you run out of pigment, our applications will become inherently a little bit darker. Not a bad thing. Especially as you move towards the left hand side, where of course there is less light. And we'll have the foliage get lost within the shadow really cathartic, fun, easy application to start off the foreground here, at least the greenery in the foreground. And then I grab some more paint and we head back in to build that up. When we apply it over a previously applied area, we really brighten that spot, bring it more so to the natural green that we have on the palette. And the areas that we miss just look like they're further inset. There we go. We are of course still trying to keep contrast, so we need spacing between a lot of our taps. And with that, I'll also work some of these upwards. We have a couple of different options in regards to how we render our larger foliage. We can do it with this, or we can do it with our filbert brush. And this area gives us an opportunity to test essentially what we'd end up with if we continued with the fan brush. Because you can essentially do both through this. It's more of a transitionary area. So go ahead, apply that. Typically we use this if we want our leaves to be smaller. We use the filbert brush if we want them to be larger and that also depends on how close or far away the tree is, so we can further imply that with this brush. But before I really take any further steps, I'm going to take a few steps back, look at the painting, and ask myself if I want larger or smaller markings rendering the majority of our leaves here in the foreground. So after reviewing from a bit of a distance, I decided that I actually really liked this amount of detail here. So I went ahead and just made a slightly brighter green using a little bit more of that Naples yellow. And now we are moving up in the tree. We're going to work predominantly towards the right hand side of our clusters to begin with. And again, we'll rotate our brush you are much closer just so you can see a bit more of the application process and how much of the foliage I'm covering up, how much I'm leaving open. But 
I essentially like to treat each cluster as its own entity. So the right hand side of each cluster will be brighter and then we'll get less and less of our spotting as you move towards the left, but we will still get some applications. Doesn't fully go away. And there can be a bit of a tighter application as we are closer to the right hand side of each cluster. And then it gets more and more spaced out while we also hope to allow our paint to dissipate. Also, this is the first of many colors that we're going to add to this foliage. We will be switching to an orange, a red, those natural fall colors that we have in the background, but it'll all be happening on the same tree. This tree will be a transitionary piece for fall and the seasons. So rather than painting it like these, all in individual colors, it will be multiple, much more interesting. Though those are a bit more simple in the background, and I think for good reason, they don't become too noticeable. They don't steal our attention. And they let this tree in the foreground really shine. There we go. So, for a tree without branches or really any change in color or foliage, I think it's starting to look really good. I'm glad we went with the smaller application for all of these leaves rather than the work with the filbert brush, though there are fall lessons on the channel where we do use the filbert brush for the leaves in the foreground, and you're more than welcome to check those out. I think I actually did one or two last year. They're very orange. We'll probably do a more orange piece a little bit later on this fall, but I think we'll also probably do a glaze towards the end of this episode where we make everything else a bit warmer. So, we will still be interjecting that in this lesson, just in a less conventional way. And it's something I've been trying to incorporate in more of these, just because I think it's such a great technique for finalizing a piece. It's very corrective. It really builds atmosphere. It can just be a really solid addition as a whole. But with that, quite happy with a lot of these. You can see that we're getting some smaller little markings poking out now. It's fun. And it's time, after a little bit of a transition here, to grab our one inch flat headed brush yet again. And we'll make this a bit brighter. So grab about maybe half of our current mixture in Naples yellow, just like that. And we'll add maybe We'll start with one eighth cadmium red and one eighth of our burnt sienna. So we're going for brighter, but also warmer. Typically, green and red, because they're complementary colors, they desaturate each other. But here, because we have the Naples yellow, we're able to get a really nice fall pigment. So, went back a couple times, added some extra red, and now we'll pick up our fan brush and start working on the next layer. Now, I know I want there to be some nice reds at the top here. We're going to be a little bit more sparing with this than we were the green. We already have a nice base layer of foliage. What we're adding here will pop out 
and give it dimension and character, but it isn't necessary for form or texture anymore. So again, we can be a little more specific with where we apply it. And I'm going to be applying some reds on top of a lot of it. We're really not moving far back for the most part within our clusters. This is something special that we save for the edges for the most part. You might have a protruding part of a cluster that really sticks out and therefore it catches light but we're going to be careful not to overdo it with this especially considering we want to add additional colors and we can always go back and build this up to a greater degree later should we want to. And then we'll have a couple nice red clusters down here towards the bottom. There we go. Oh, I can already I can already see how this is going to turn out. I'm really happy. Good. Okay. So Yet again, I'm going to take a couple of steps back, make sure that we're applying this in all of the areas that we want to, and then provided we have enough of it, we can work with the next color. So after taking said steps back, I realized that I really liked the direction it was going in, but this still isn't really bright enough. So if we were to add our red in the reds that we wanted, reds like that, they would really stand out in an awkward way against what we have here. The values just aren't there yet. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab essentially an equal mixture of Naples yellow as to what we currently have here in our mix. We'll bring that in. We'll need to warm it. One eighth cad red, one eighth burnt sienna, just like so. Again, it's not a red pigment. It's not a green pigment. It's fairly earthy, good fall. Put our brush down, grab that nice fan brush, and we'll go in fairly selectively at first because this is quite bright in comparison to what else we have. This is another scenario where you might want to paint holding the brush from farther away and standing farther away from the canvas just so you can see how it's being affected as a whole. And I think I'm going to do that right now. Now, I'm applying this initially to exclusively the edges and protruding areas, but something you probably see, as well as what I see, this is a little too strong to exist in those areas and only those areas. It looks a little bit awkward, so what we're going to do is we're going to start working it back a little bit, not to a massive degree, but enough that it feels natural within its setting. So the tree as a whole is going to get a little bit brighter, but we're not covering the entirety of it. We're still leaving lots of openings, especially in the shadows, and the other greens can still show their way through. I think realistically, this is our only problem area. And let's see if we can nullify that by adding in some extra highlights. There we go. We can also separate some of these highlights should we need to with the liner brush. And I'm really dancing around trying to get different areas There we go. Leaving this intentionally darker to show that there's another side of the tree. Not all of it is going to be lit up. And we'll bring this down into the body as well. But it'll dissipate as we get towards the bottom.
Now, for an area like this that does become a little too consumed, I am going to switch back to my liner brush, grab a little bit of Mars Black, Sap Green, equal mixture of Naples Yellow to Sap Green. We have a nice dark but warm pigment. And we're just going to separate a couple of our leaves. We've been painting, adding them on, but now we can also add back in shadow, diversify areas that just became a little too bright, or simply didn't have the contrast that we wanted anymore. So you can work both ways. And this is why you really don't have to fear not doing it right, because you can always work backwards and give it a really natural, good look. Even if there's like a larger cluster, for instance right here, you can see that with some deliberate tapping, we can simplify, add back in that contrast, and make it look a whole lot better, very quickly, for minimal effort. So. With that, I'm actually quite happy with the separations that we added. I don't think we need to do much more. I'm just kind of pitter-pattering. So we'll step farther back again, and if we like it, we'll move on to the next color and addition. So I do really like the separation that we've achieved at this point, and I feel like we have enough bright highlights to start working into some of the reds. So we're going to continue working with partially our current mixture, I'll move some off to the side, but not too, too much. Then we'll grab an abundance of our cadmium red. And about an equal mixture yet again of the burnt sienna. The burnt sienna just keeps it nice and earthy. Mix that about. Spread it to the point where we can grab it efficiently with the fan brush. Put that down. Make sure that our fan brush is nice and damp. Grab some of this nice new pigment. If you find some of your bristles are sticking together too much, you can either take them apart with your hand or patter it against the palette. And now, I'm just going to look at the reference photo, find where the majority of the red applications are. There are quite a few towards the bottom here. So we'll start with that. Simply because it's a less prominent area and if we need to cover it up, it'll be easier to do than one of the top portions, which also potentially has the sky involved. Now we'll take a little bit of a spatial break, work over towards the right hand side. Very good. And now we'll tap some of our foliage into the ground. Further tying in our rocks with everything else. And you can see that the colors are relatively cohesive. I know that uh, you can only really see a couple right there, but we really didn't do too many more at this point. With that, we do need to further move up and expand. You can tell that on the photo we have some through here. Lots of tapping and rotating. Then we have more through here. And again, you don't have to follow the reference photo or what I'm doing exactly either. You are more than welcome to take those artistic liberties and go about it in the way that you feel best suits your painting. But I think as a base, I really like what I see in the photo. And I'm going to work off that. And then I can see hints of it over on the edges of this painting. There we go. Just a couple little splashes about. But it's time to work into even more of a red. So, I like this pigment, but we need it to be more saturated, so we add more of our cadmium red. I'm not going to add more of our burnt sienna this time, simply because I know our burnt sienna we'll end up muting it a little bit in that 
as it becomes more earthy, it becomes more visually synonymous with all of our other earthy pigments. So we're looking for something that's more so akin to, in nature, the color you'd find in a, a berry. Though we aren't actually painting berries. <laughs> it's more just to say we're moving away from the more brown tones. So, highlights on some of these bottom portions. Again, we test here because it's the easiest to fix should we need to. I'll do a couple little applications down here. Maybe even some resting on top of the rock. We'll jump around, not covering all of our previous applications. Just the areas that I feel could use the additional highlight. You can see that I'm holding pretty close to the top of the brush just so I have some additional control. However, if you find that you're getting two similar results and you don't have the variance you want, just hold that brush farther back. You get a more randomized application. Again, harder to do something intentionally, but that is the point. There we go. Oh, I really like that. Okay, turning out quite well so far. We'll put our brush down, pick up our other one, and we'll go for a bit more of a pinkish red. So rather than using our Naples yellow, which might move it in the direction of an orange, we're going to use titanium white, which moves red in the direction of pink, but we're not going to use too, too much. In fact, that is probably the brightest we are going to reach. So back to our brush. Nice and damp, cleaning off the previous pigment. Into our testing zone. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay. Really love that color. It's the pop that we've definitely been looking for. So we just built up to it. Took a little while, but we got there. And all of those layers really built something that looks like it has mass and diversity. All of these good things. Truly a tree transitioning through the seasons. One of those processes that's incredibly fun and easy to just continuously do, but you do have to stop and <laughs> ask yourself, okay, do I really want more pigment here? Is this correct? Will it actually look better with the addition or am I just tapping it on because I'm enjoying the process? Trying to be a bit more precise with these applications here. taking a little bit longer, rotating the brush so that I only get one or two taps of pigment every time. We've done the randomized effect and now we are solidifying ideas. Let's move a little bit farther down before we finish off this area and interject some of this in the bottom rocky portion. So heading back down to the bottom, we can really grab pigment from all three of our mixtures here. I'm going to aim predominantly for the open areas of ground, but there will be some occasions like right here where I do try to get some leaves on the actual rocks. 
It'll be a bit more rare, but it can be good. So, we added that color. Now we'll move on to more of the darker red. I kept a little bit of each pigment on my palette, but you can remix it, and remixing it will just make you a stronger color mixer. Generally, mixing it once is good. You learn the idea why we're mixing to that color, how we get there, but you really enforce it and m memorize it when you have to do it a couple times and go through that remix process. There we go. I'm also going to tap some of these out into the water. I think this is a step that normally makes it a whole lot better. Go back to the yellows. Again, diversify as best we can. Have some kind of get lost as we move into the distance. Very small taps, next to no pressure. Trying to get them smaller and smaller as you move farther and farther away. There we go. I know that it isn't all on camera, but hopefully you're getting the idea. One of those issues with moving the camera close for detail for an area like this and then getting distracted elsewhere, right? I'll move it back a little bit. Okay, so here we can see it's all starting to come together. Each element, the water, the rocks, this and then that, they all flow into each other because we now have a common subject which connects them. And that's exactly what we were looking to do. Trying to make my applications out on the water nice and thick. So I'm applying a little bit more pressure, creating larger leaves here in the foreground. If they're semi-transparent, it's going to look like they're slightly underwater, which can be a nice effect. However, what I'm really looking to do here, above all, is balance all of this. Make it feel cohesive. Going in with multiple colors. There we go. Again, just trying to not overdo it. Being mindful of where I actually need pigment. So while we are still without any branches on the tree at all, we don't have the tree trunk. While we don't have that, before we go ahead and add it, I'm going to go back in this area of the painting and warm it up a little bit, as I previously noted, with a glaze. This will just make it more of the hue that we have down here, a little bit more cohesive. You don't have to do it if you are already quite satisfied with this backing area, but it's a good lesson to learn regardless, and once this is done, we can come back to the tree and our foreground. So for this, I want to cover a large area and do so in a relatively quick period of time. So we are going back to the one inch flat headed brush. I'm going to make my brush very wet. I normally say damp, where I tap the bottom third into the water and then I remove it and then I wipe it off three or four times on the edge of the water. Here I'm just dipping it in, I might wipe it off once. With that, we need a color for our glaze. This is going to be a combination. We'll grab our burnt sienna being careful to only grab burnt sienna, not actually the green that's mixed in, uh, and we'll grab but an equal mixture of our Naples yellow. Now, Naples yellow is a very thick pigment, and so I think I'm actually going to double down on the burnt sienna until we have this nice, warm, but earthy pigment. We'll make our brush wet yet again, and we'll essentially add water to the point where it's dripping on the palette, and it's almost like a watercolor. 
Once we have that, and this is entirely dry, we can go back, and I'm going to start in the grass because that'll be the easiest to remedy if it doesn't work out. And then I'll work my way up over our trees. And the idea with the glaze is that you subtly change your hue over time without changing any of the values for the most part or any of the line work. So we can add either a cool or a warm filter, essentially, to what we're working on without hindering any of the detail. And this is great if you decide throughout the piece that, you know what, I want it to be a little bit warmer or I want it to be a little bit cooler. This is your opportunity to go back and do that. So again, we do this very gradually. I'll grab more of my burnt sienna. We don't need much paint at all. The majority of these mixtures are water. I think I'm going to go one fourth for our Naples yellow, and I'll maybe go one eighth for cadmium red as well. Really warm it up. With that, yet again, I'm going to start in the grass. Oh, and this is it. That's brilliant. Trying to get even coverage. Trying to be careful along my edges. And we can even interject this a little bit into our reflection. Just like so. Really nice and easy. Just build that up a little bit. We're essentially painting wet into dry. Though, it's worth noting, it's very, very important that in this process, you make sure all of this is dry, all of those leaves are dry, because if they're not, you may accidentally pick up pigment you don't want that's much more thick, and start moving around something that does change the detail and the value of what you have. That said, I'm going to take all of the water off of my brush, all of the pigment, add on some water, and I was going to wipe off some of the orange here, but I didn't take off enough pigment. So I'm just going to do a little bit of finger painting here and remove it like so. That said, very happy with that. Really like how warm that is. Maybe we'll go back and make it more warm. Probably not, but while we're here, I just note that we can in case you'd like to later on. Uh, it's just a little bit easier before we add in our branches, but I can mix up a little bit more of this. You can see it's dripping all over my palette. And because this is all dry, we can warm up these areas as well. Not exclusive to the background. It's also not dramatic here because this area was already painted to be warmer. Do be careful of your sky, though, in between. Okay, with that, yet again, a little bit closer and working on some branches. So the first step here is going to be adding some burnt umber back to our palette, which we will start by grabbing with our liner brush. Everything here has essentially dried, so I'm not too worried about mixing with it, but even if it weren't, it wouldn't be the worst thing. I'll grab about half our burnt sienna that we used of the umber, and then maybe one fourth in Mars black with one fifth titanium white. Then we'll make a semi-watery variant of this. And I'm going to start by bracing my pinky finger on the canvas to alleviate shake. I'm going to go out to the end of where I want one of my branches to be going to press as lightly as I can and then work my way back into the bushes through a series of winding applications. And you know what? I think I'm actually going to go with a smaller liner brush than this, but 
Before I do, I'm going to mix up significantly more paint because the smaller the brush we use, the harder it will be to get a proper mixture. And we have an opportunity right now to do a good job. So let's just grab a little bit more titanium white, mix that up, take the excess off our brush so it doesn't dry, grab an even smaller one. You don't have to grab a smaller one, especially if you're working with a larger canvas, but we'll make this a little bit easier. So again, I like to start on the end and you can connect these. I try to make them look fairly jagged, so I opt for less rounded motions, more jittery pieces. There we go. Gonna add lots of little protruding branches to our pre-established areas. This is going to create some nice additional depth between the water all of this. There we go. We'll make them overlap each other. That's also important. And I am going to go over some a couple of times just to darken them a little bit. There we go. Really, really happy with this as well. It's one of those ending stretches that just comes together so nicely. Sometimes you have to make a lot of adjustments and do some course correcting in a major way. And I guess we kind of had to do some glazing, but even that wasn't necessary. We just kind of pushed the painting a little bit farther into the fall season. Just working in as many small details as I possibly can. Grab some extra Mars Black, make a darker mixture, which I'll use for the areas that are closer to the bush. Now we'll continue our branch endeavors a little bit higher in the canvas. I'll be switching back to the Filbert brush because I do want to be able to pick up and move around a bit more paint for the larger tree trunk and protruding pieces. That said, we are going to start by making sure that our brush is damp and then grab a good amount of that burnt umber, maybe one fourth that Mars black, two thirds of that burnt sienna, and maybe one fifth that titanium white. Added a little bit too much titanium white, so we'll just reintroduce our other colors. And now we have a good dark base. So what I'm going to do with this is weave branches in and out of our foliage. So here, as you can see, it is in front of all of this. You can paint around a couple pieces if you'd like you can also very easily go back in and just re-render additional foliage. And I think that's often the best play. So we'll have it come down to there. You can see it's getting lost in some of the greenery, some of the more pinkish orange. We'll have it re-emerge. And it is going to get lost within this darker space down there. Now we'll grab some of that additional paint and I can see a, a fairly large branch that branches out from here. It's so hard not to say that in every lesson. But we'll start incorporating this as well. We want to ensure that the protruding branches are smaller than the 
primary body and we'll have this come up there but then we'll also have a break off that goes like that. Now I'm using quite a bit of water in this as you can probably tell semi-transparent for sure. I'm doing that so that I can get some better coverage and I will go back later and clean it all up with a second application. That said, here I'm looking for openings and often an opening is a space that looks like it's a bit darker. The more bright an area is means it's often more full sticking out to a, a greater degree and we're trying to find the areas that are more inset for this to show up and through. Now I'm just going to do another quick little application to our first layers. And once this is done and dry, we have two options. We can go back in with smaller branches, or we can start applying our really warm highlights to this. But here on our second pass, the form really starts to show through in a nice way. And see we're really doing a lot of weaving. Okay, so very happy with that. Let's switch to one of our liner brushes probably the slightly larger one. Grab some of this. Find some areas that could use proper expansion. Connect to some of the other leaves which might be out of the general clusters due to the tapping effect that we had earlier with the fan brush. Gave us a very randomized application and while you may want some of these leaves to look like they are falling and therefore it's actually a really good luck to have them not connected to the tree, you are going to want quite a number of them to be reconnected. And this is a great way of going about it. There we are. Still just trying to find lots of little openings. Advantageous areas. There we go. Here coming out, bringing it back in, implying that maybe it gets larger, or rather shows a, a larger portion up here. But because we are implying that it could be this branch, we need to make it wider, because remember branches get wider as we move up and expand. So far, so good. Very watery mixture, but I think at this point you've put so much work into the painting, it's not really worth rushing to get a thick application so that it's done a little bit faster. You might as well take the time and do it right. And this gives us the opportunity to test it a little bit more appropriately. Nice. Small application down here, subtle, 
And I think we'll do a couple more to the top. This is what's really going to add a lot of life and realism to the piece. But we still are not done. We definitely need some highlights on it. So I'll get you a little bit closer and we'll work on applying those together. So it looks like our branches are fully dry to the touch. We are going to be applying highlight with our liner brush. This one's a little bit bigger just so I can get slightly more coverage but the light is coming in this way. It's going to illuminate the right hand side of all of our branches. So how are we going to illuminate that? We're going to start with a very common color in the painting and that is burnt sienna. Really the MVP here. It's earthy, it's saturated, it's all of the good things. We'll add an even mixture of our Naples yellow. We'll add a hint of our titanium white, but not much. I don't want to desaturate this greatly. I really like the natural pigment of it. And we'll grab the smallest hint, maybe 1 12th of Mars black. Now, we'll grab said pigment. We'll do a little test in an area that protrudes and we'll catch quite a bit of light. Excellent. Similar to our leaves to a point, but it still stands out. Now, as you can see, I'm making many markings rather than a singular one. That way we can get some texture in there. Maybe it looks like a little bit of bark. There we are. Light coming in. And I think I might make it a little bit more red. So we will add some of our cadmium red medium hue. Not much. We'll apply it in low quantities, at least in the beginning. Go back over a lot of those applications. Find the edge of our next branch. And we can really dance between the more red and more yellow mixtures till we find exactly what we're looking for. This is quite bright, arguably more so than any of the pigments we have in the actual foliage. So we're going to give it a go and if we feel like it's just too much we can always tone it down with another layer and application. We can also and this will probably look really nice. Create more of a burnt sienna version and line that right behind what we were just doing. Should build some nice depth. Let it dissipate as we move into the back of the tree. Here we're really jumping about. There we go. Really nice. And as we continue winding around, we'll grab some burnt umber, make it a bit more earthy, but also a bit more desaturated. The burnt umber is less saturated than the burnt sienna. So it won't be as extreme. And as we move towards that left hand side, we do want to continue to mutin and darken it. So now yet again, more burnt sienna in the mix, but also a little bit of Mars black. Now we are really rendering a good three-dimensional base for our tree. Give it a natural look. It won't pop as much because we're essentially removing some level of contrast in that we're taking that extremely dark base and 
we are working something that has a bit more hue to it. So it doesn't pop in the same way with the highlight, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Going over a lot of these areas a couple of times, I find that the more we build it up through slight variance of color, the better it looks. Grab some of that highlight that's still at the top there. Reintroduce that to some of these smaller branches. Didn't quite get a great deal of it. And we can also pull back, see how it's looking as we progress. With a little bit of a tapping effect. That can also be really nice for close up wood. Give it some added texture. Now, upon taking some steps back, I think it's quite evident that we really built up some highlight right along this edge, but it didn't really follow through here or to the bottom in these extended branches, and that's something I really like a lot. We have some of this brighter orange that was interjected in the background doing some real work here, and I, I'd like to continue that. So we'll grab our cadmium red because we definitely know we need the saturation for it. We'll mix right down here. We'll grab equal mixture of our Naples yellow, equal mixture of our burnt sienna, and a little bit of titanium white to brighten it, but again be careful because it will desaturate it. I'll go in with a test right along our previous applications, and I like it, but I feel like this is actually much more orange than our current mixture. So we'll add some cadmium yellow deep hue, a little bit more cad red, and that really did it. Watch this. I feel like even from a distance, it'll be noticeable. And again, I'm not... not continuously creating a longer line, creating lots of little lines that amalgamate to create the larger piece. Now when we do this, we definitely open ourselves up to the opportunity of going back in and wrapping more of that light around the tree. Really up to you and how stark you want this to be in the end. But I'm also going to take little bits and I'm going to tap it inside just to show that there are protruding pieces of bark that will catch just as much light despite the fact that they are a couple inches in in this larger piece. And I'm also going over some of these smaller branches with this highlight as well, just because I think it's so aesthetically pleasing. Really ties the foreground into the background. And now, we will do a little bit of that transition. Just grab some burnt umber, and we'll work that on the inner portion, what we have going on and maybe on some of the branches that aren't going to have a massive amount of light, but we still want to get some additional attention. All right? Not all branches have to have this extreme highlight, and in fact it'll look better if you have more varied option. So this secondary mix, which still isn't dark but isn't hyper bright, is great for those areas. With that said, I am sure this is going to be one of the longest lessons on the channel, very detailed, and I'd like to say a really, really big thank you to all of you for watching, especially if you made it this far. I think that shows a lot of dedication, and I'm sure that 
it will definitely pay off. I feel like you go into these with as much information as you can and often that brings you far places. So I hope you find lots of success throughout your painting journey with this one here. I'd also like to say a big thank you to everybody up over on Patreon for directly supporting this channel. This is a community funded channel. I don't put ads throughout the middle of the videos. While that can be a, a great source of revenue, we, we don't have to do that. Uh, I've, I've never wanted to. I feel like that kind of disturbs the painting process and because of the great support and the incredible supporters, we only put one at the start at the end, which I feel like is fair for, uh, you know, potentially a four hour lesson. I'm not sure how long it'll be. You'll know. But big thank you to everybody up there. Could not do this without you. And it also, again, just allows us to make longer lessons like this where otherwise it wouldn't be possible and I'd kind of have to make the shorter videos that probably do better in the algorithm. So, big thank you. And if you are new to the channel, you can help support it by going up over on Patreon, but there you can also get the traceables to help you with the drawing process, the reference photos, so you can print them out and do color matching directly on them. You can get access to my eBooks, including Acrylics for Beginners, which is essentially the essentials Everything you need to know about acrylic painting before you jump into your first acrylic painting. Talk about glazing, color mixing, what brushes to use, use of water, composition, all that good stuff. You can also get access to our exclusive Facebook group where everybody posts their renditions of these and it's pretty neat to see all of the different versions. Generally you can pick up a couple good ideas and techniques. I try to hop in there as much as I can, but I, admittedly, yeah, I feel like we've grown it to a place where the community does a really good job of helping each other and being encouraging. Actually, really, really nice, <laughs> really encouraging community. I, I feel like I'm uh, kind of distracted while I'm talking, but I, I would like to stress that. Everybody who is there posts regularly. Thank you for just being so wonderful to each other. It, it really is a treat to hop in there and just see the goodwill. Um, but yeah, big, big thank you to all of you. And also, if you can't support the channel up over there, that's also okay. Again, we have a lot of great people who do, and I recognize that not everybody can all the time, and I just appreciate that you're here with me right now. Again, I think it's fantastic that you made it this far. I hope your lesson, or your rendition of the lesson, turns out really lovely, and then you get something you're proud of, you get something that you feel like you've learned a lot from, and something that you can take these ideas, different pieces, and interject them into your own work or future lessons as well. It's, it's always the goal. I uh, personally had a lot of fun. Orange is my favorite color. I love every fall getting to dive into pieces like this, and I feel like throughout the year I save a bunch of fall pictures, and then in the end I get to pick my three or four favorites for our lessons. And this one was one that I just felt like we had to do. I love, love and uh, a painting has a lot of depth, you know, we have all the distant trees, and then we have the water and the rocks and different types of foliage, it's just, it's got it all very subtle clouds, that was something I wanted to do for fall. Here we're tapping on some additional little leaves and you can even have some falling. I'm not going to do too many, but that's often something I really like. It shows that there is wind. There we go. And with that, I think that's our lesson. So, one of those where it's hard to put down the brush because it's a lot of fun and we can always keep tinkering and I probably will. But for today, I'm very happy and I hope you are too. So thank you for spending this time with me here today. I have a couple more fall lessons I have started and I think that they're uh, going to be just as special. So I will see you soon. 
with a brand new painting lesson. But as always, we will have a uh, little code word here at the end of the video, something you can use in the comments to just kind of note uh, in a very uh, casual way that you were one of the few to make it to the end. Often only, I believe, 13% of people make it to the end. So if you are one of those 13%, uh, I'd love to see branching off as a, uh, a term used. You can either just put it as the comment, you can incorporate it in a sentence, but it is a subtle way to let myself and everybody else who got this far know that you too did. And it's always fun to kind of keep track of who continuously does and all of that. So that is our term. That is our lesson. I hope you have a wonderful start to the fall season. I'll see you soon with a new lesson. And I'll post the traceables and the material list to the next one early up over on Patreon as well. So see you soon and take care. Stay creative.